Good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to call to order the April 14th, 2021 meeting of the Virginia Beach Planning Commission. My name is David Weiner, act as the chair. Uh, before we get started, I've asked uh, Commissioner Oliver to lead us in prayer and Commissioner Horsley to lead us in the pledge. Please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for your guidance and wisdom. As we begin this hearing today, guide our hearts and our minds in the spirit of fairness, right thought and speech. Help us to remember our responsibility to serve our community with great insight, guided by understanding, wisdom and respect for all. As we make our decisions today, help us to promote the common good as we work together for the betterment of our great city. As trusted servants, we seek blessings on our deliberations and on our efforts here today. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next, ask Mrs. Klein, Commissioner Klein, to introduce the members, please. <clears throat> All right, we have uh, John Costin, retired Virginia Beach fire captain and member at large. Whitney Graham, real estate developer from the Lynn Haven District. Michael Inman, attorney and member at large. Vice Chair Jack Wall, civil engineer from Rose Hall District. Chairman David Weiner, commercial salesman from Kempsville District. D. Oliver, funeral director and member at large. George Alcaraz, building contractor from Beach District. Myself, Robin Klein, social worker from Centerville District. And Don Horsley, farmer and member at large. Thank you. Next is the um, explanation of the rules. And um, Madam Clerk, do you please read that? Thank you. Today, we will have both in-person speakers and speakers participating via WebEx. In order to limit the number of people in Suite 5 at any one time, in-person speakers will remain in Suite 4, where they will be able to view the meeting on monitors until called. For ordinances and resolutions, we will recognize in-person speakers first, calling the first speaker and up to three additional speakers to avoid any unnecessary delay between speakers. Each person whose name is called may enter suite five and must remain socially distanced until it is their turn to speak. Each speaker must exit suite five after providing their comments and may return to suite four to finish viewing the meeting. After all in-person speakers have been called, we will then recognize the speakers participating via WebEx. We will recognize the applicant or their representative first, whether they are in person or participating via WebEx. All other speakers will be recognized as previously stated. Speakers participating via WebEx, please mute any additional devices you have in the room to avoid any unnecessary background noise and or the possibility of echoing and reverberation. It is important that once recognized, please wait two to three seconds to begin to ensure the commission hears your complete remarks. Please begin your comments by identifying yourself. Also, do not ask, can you hear me, as only one feed is open at a time to minimize the echo and reverberation, and as such, you will be unable to hear a response. Again, speakers will be recognized in the order which they registered. Please note, if a speaker does not respond or if a technical issue occurs, which renders the comments unintelligible, I will move on to the next registered speaker. Commissioners, are there any questions about the process for the speakers? Okay, hearing none, I will go on to read the public hearing rules. The Virginia Beach Planning Commission takes pride in being fair and courteous to all parties in attendance. It is important that all involved understand how the commission normally conducts its meetings. It's equally important that everyone treat each other and the members of the commission with respect and civility. The commission requests that if you have a cell phone, please either silence it or turn it off. This is an abbreviated explanation of the rules. The complete set of rules is located in the front of the Planning Commission agenda. Following is the order of business for this public hearing. Withdrawals and deferrals. The chairman will ask if there are any requests to withdraw or defer an item on the agenda. Consideration of these requests will be made first. Consent agenda. The second order of business is the consideration of the consent agenda, which are those items that the Planning Commission believe are unopposed and which have favorable staff recommendation and the regular agenda, 
The commission will then proceed with the remaining items on the agenda. Speakers in support or opposition of an um, agenda item will have three minutes to speak unless they are solely representing a large group, such as a civic league or homeowners association, in which case they have 10 minutes. Please note that the actions taken today by, are in the form of a recommendation to the Virginia Beach City Council. The final decision to approve or disapprove an application will be made by the City Council. The Commission thanks you for your attendance and we hope that your experience here today leaves you feeling that you have been heard and treated fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The next order of business, the items to be deferred or withdrawn. I don't believe there are no items to be deferred. Is there any items to be deferred by anybody? None. The Chair recognizes that we have one item to be withdrawn, item number six. Is there any opposition for item number six being withdrawn? All right, hearing none, can I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we um, withdraw item, agenda item number six. We have a motion and a second. 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 Motion by Mr. Wall and a second by Mr. Horsley. Okay. Ready to vote? Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. M Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By recorded vote of nine to zero, agenda item number six has been withdrawn. Thank you. Next item is the consent agenda. We'll turn that over to Vice Chair Wall. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, these applications, <clears throat> these are applications that are recommended for approval by staff and the Planning Commission concurred, and there are no speakers signed up in opposition. We have 12 items on the consent agenda today. Uh, the first item is agenda item number two, City of Virginia Beach, an ordinance to amend section 232 of the city's zoning ordinance pertaining to communication towers and fee. <clears throat> is there a representative for this item? Yep, Ms. Wilson. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Kay Wilson, Deputy City Attorney for the City of Virginia Beach. <clears throat> this is an ordinance that establishes fees for communications towers. Um, the fees are broken into two parts. One is for administrative review, and that's a fee of $350. And the other is a fee of $1,050 for those that are um, going to go by the standard process, which is the same as for a conditional use permit. Might as well stay in there. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Um, is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. The, uh, the next agenda item is agenda item number three, City of Virginia Beach, an ordinance to amend sections 207 and 232 of the city zoning ordinance <clears throat> pertaining to communication towers, small cell facilities, and building mounted antenna. Um, is there a representative for this item? Please, uh, please state your name for the record. Deputy City Attorney Kay Wilson. This is an ordinance to do a little housekeeping on the portion of the city zoning ordinance that pertains to communications towers. Um, what we've done is, is just cleaned it up, make sure it coincided with the next ordinance. And so that is it's mainly housekeeping um, and things of that nature. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there any opposition for this item to be <clears throat> on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we're going to move to agenda item number four. Um, is there a representative for this item? Please state your name for the record. <laughs> I'm Debbie City Attorney Kay Wilson. Okay, this is um, City of Virginia Beach, um, an ordinance to amend the city zoning ordinance sections 301, 401, 501, 601, 701. 801, 901, 1001, 1501, 1521, 1531, 2203 in sections 5.2, 5.2.16, and 5.3.17 of the form-based code, Oceanfront Resort District pertaining to communication towers, small cell facilities, building mounted antenna, and temporary towers. What we had to do here is go through the use tables 
for all of the zoning districts and make a determination as to whether um, towers and their iterations should be um, conditional or permitted. Most of them are permitted unless they are um, a standard review tower, which is any tower over 50 feet. And so they would be done like a CUP. Um, we had already taken out a lot of the things that we were normally seeing with these communication towers, balloon tests, landscaping, but to the um, credit of the um, people who, who own the cell towers, they have been doing this anyway, even though they're not required to do so. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we're gonna to move to the next um, item on the um, agenda. Next item is agenda number, um, is application number five um, for a street closure. Um, Anatoly and Joy and Dritschilo. Um, is there a representative for this item? Thank you, Vice Chair Wall, Chairman Wiener, members of the commission for the record, Eddie Berdom, Chief Attorney representing the Dritschillos. Um, the four conditions are acceptable to my client. We appreciate very much being on the consent agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Um, hearing none, uh, the Planning Commission has asked uh, Ms. Oliver to read this, um, this item into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. This is pretty simple. This is an applicant is requesting to close a portion of the platted, unnamed, and unimproved alley that is adjacent to the rear lot line. Um, this site is developed and consistent with the other residential lots in the Croatan neighborhood with a single family home in a fenced in backyard. Currently the area proposed to be closed is fenced off and will be used and maintained by the applicant. As required by the city code, a viewers meeting was held in February the 16th, um, 2021 that included the staff from the departments of public works, public utilities, planning and community development and the office of the city attorney. The viewers determined that the proposed closure will not result in any public inconvenience and therefore closure of this portion of the right of way is deemed acceptable. Condition two is recommended below whereby the city of Virginia Beach will retain a public drainage easement over the closed portion of the alley. And based on the considerations above, the staff was recommending approval for the proposed street closure subject to the conditions listed, and therefore we've placed it on the consent agenda. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Uh, the next item on the agenda is um, agenda item number nine, City of Virginia Beach. Uh, rezoning um, R5D residential duplex to R7.5 residential. Um, is there a representative for this item? The representative. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. We do have a speaker, Jennifer Dew. Ms. Dew, if you will wait two to three seconds and then start your comments. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Dew, right of way agent with the Public Works Real Estate Office. And I am the representative for the city's application for the rezoning at 206 Bob Lane, agenda item number nine. The city is requesting to rezone this property from R5D duplex to R7-5 residential. This city owned property is currently vacant and is located in the Oceana Gardens West neighborhood. The property was acquired on February 3rd, 2014 as part of the city's acquisition program to prevent further development of incompatible uses in the APZ1 accident potential zone surrounding NAS Oceana. At the time of the acquisition, the property was developed with a residential duplex that has since been demolished. City Council has approved sale of the lot to the adjacent property owners. Each half of this lot will be sold to each adjacent property owner located at 200 
and 208 Bob Lane to be incorporated into their existing lots. The property will be resubdivided to eliminate the interior lot lines and is being rezoned to prevent dual zoning on the newly created lots. Under current city policy, the city pays to perform the resubdivision to vacate the interior lot lines. The property will be sold with a deed restriction that prevents any new dwelling from being constructed. The owners could build a fence, a pool, a shed, or a garage on the property. They could also rebuild their home as long as they complied with the site plan requirements. Staff is recommending approval of this request. I will stand by for any questions. Is there any opposition for this item to be placed on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we'll move to the next um, agenda item. The next agenda item is agenda item number 10, A and G Auto Sales, um, G and A Properties LLC, conditional use permit for motor vehicle sales and rentals. Is there a representative for this item? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Again, Chairman Weiner, member of the commission, Eddie Berdon, Virginia Beach Attorney representing A&G. Um, we appreciate being placed on the consent agenda. All 16 conditions as recommended by staff are acceptable to the applicant. I want to thank Marcel for her work on this application. There were a number of moving parts going through this, and we appreciate being on consent. Thank you. Is there any opposition for this application to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none. Uh, the commission has asked uh, Mr. Costin to read this into the record. The applicant is <clears throat> requesting a conditional use permit for motor vehicle sales, rentals on property located B2 Community Business District. The site is developed with a 2,900 square foot one story building constructed in 1969 that was previously occupied by a title loan business. The applicant proposes to display up to 74 vehicles on the site, no auto repairs proposed on site, and a condition is recommended prohibiting that activity. To ensure that this more intense use is not permitted adjacent to the single family dwelling to the north of the site. The applicant is seeking a deviation to the foundation landscaping requirement along Pica Lane and the 12% display area interior landscaping requirement. In lieu of the foundation plannings along Pica Lane, the applicant will install additional parking plantings in the street frontage along Pica Lane. In regard to the minimum 12% interior landscaping, the applicant intends to install landscaping along the northeastern border of the site totaling approximately 790 square feet, roughly half of the required 12% interior landscaping. Based on this, an elevation deviation to the required landscape screening is requested. The concept plan depicts a proposed freestanding sign located near the intersection of Newtown Road and Baker Road, as shown in the submitted elevation. This eight foot tall sign will be monument style with the brick base to match the brick material on the existing structure. Typical hours of operation are proposed as 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. There will be two to four employees on the property during regular business hours. Staff has recommended approval and we have therefore placed this item on the consent <clears throat> agenda. Thank you, Mr. Costin. The, uh, the next um, item on the agenda is, is number 11, the Virginia Beach Winery LLC applicant, um, Siphon Development Company property owner for a conditional use permit, Craft Winery. Is there a representative for this item? Thank you again. <clears throat> for the record, Eddie Burdon, Bridge Beach Attorney, representing the applicant. Uh, Joshua and Maria Robeson, the uh, principals of Virginia Beach Winery, were here. Um, I advise them that they could go back to work. Um, we appreciate this application being placed on the consent agenda. All five conditions as recommended by staff are um, approved or acceptable to my hmm. client and appreciate WA's efforts on this application. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we've asked Mr. Graham to read this into the record. Thank you. Uh, this application is for a 820 square foot craft winery and 8,825 square foot wine tasting room. 
The applicant is seeking a conditional use permit to allow its intended use as a craft winery. The property is located at, at uh, 1064 Linhaven Parkway in Suites 110 through 113 in the Rose Hall District. The app applicant has agreed to all conditions. Uh, uh, planning Commission agrees with planning staff's recommendation to approve the application uh, and therefore has placed the uh, placed agenda mm -hmm. item 11 on the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, the next application is application number 12, um, Kroll Investment Group, LLC, um, modification of proffers. Um, is there a representative for this item? Again, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, for the record, Eddie Berdon, the attorney representing uh, Kroll uh, Investments. This is a proffer modification, so there are no conditions other than the proffers um, that we've modified in simple application. Again, appreciate being on the consent agenda. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we've asked Mr. Inman to read this into the record. Thank you. This is an application for modification of proffers. The subject site is in the Taylor Farm Commerce Park and was zoned uh, conditional I-1 back in 2002. The issue here is that the exterior facade of the building constructed in Taylor Farm Park must be uh, brick split face block, painted block, concrete panel, stone wood, IFAS or metal and be of an earth tone. The request is to modify the proffers to allow for the use of fiberboard uh, hardy, hardy plank. The, um, the staff's opinion that the cement fiberboard as a permitted construction material within the park is acceptable. Surrounding buildings are industrial and uh, some office. This is uh, gonna be more of an office appearance but also have a uh, storage area. It's felt that this is consistent with the comprehensive plan recommendation that calls for development along key roadways to have an attractive, high quality architectural building materials and design. So on that basis, the, uh, we agree and put it on the consent agenda. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next item on the agenda is agenda item number 14. CRP GREP Overture Chesapeake owner, LLC, um, it's an applicant, and CFC LLC is the property owner. For modifications of conditions, is there a representative for this item? Good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Grady Palmer. I'm an attorney. I represent the property owner. Uh, we appreciate being put on consent, and we are in agreement with the recommended conditions. Thank you. I'll stand by. Okay. Um, is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we've asked Mr. Graham to read this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. This, applicant, this application is for the Overture Apartments in the Shore Drive area of Virginia Beach at 3399 Ocean Shore Avenue. Uh, the applicant has applied for a modification of conditions to allow a freestanding monument sign to be located on Cherry Tree, Cherry Tree Place. Um, the applicant has worked with the Bayfront Advisory Board uh, to uh, come up with an appropriate size for the sign. Uh, Planning Commission agrees with planning staff's recommendation to approve the application and therefore has placed agenda item 14 on the consent agenda. <clears throat> Thank you. The next application is application number 16, North Landing Beach RV Resort and Cottages, Virginia Beach LLC, uh, for a modification of conditions for a recreational campground. Is there a representative for this item? Mr. Vice Chair, there is. It's a virtual. Okay. Robert Simon. Mr. Simon, if you would wait two to three seconds and then begin your comments. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, Robert Simon here to represent the North Landing Beach 
campground, resort and campground. I'd like to say uh, thank you to the staff for working with us on this, and we are in agreement with the 14 conditions that they have recommended, and we appreciate being put it on, uh, being put on the consent agenda. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we've asked Mr. Horsley to read this into the record. Thank you, Jack. The uh... North Landing Beach RV and Resort and Cottages has done an outstanding job of renovating that campground since purchasing it in 2014. I think the original campground was established back in the early 70s, but it was nothing like what, what, what's there now. It's, it's become one of the top rated campgrounds in the country now also. But uh, due to the popularity of this campground, they've decided to make some improvements, that's the reason they want to modify the conditions. They want to put in a uh, non-commercial marina to be used by their guests only, a marina store, a comfort station, screen gazebo, event space, and in addition to the existing arts and crafts room is, uh, is what, their, what their goal is to do that. Um, staff has looked over all these uh, requests and they've deemed them worthy and the um, conditions from the 2019 use permit will all be uh, deleted and the 14 new conditions will be established in the, uh, in the new modifications. So there were no, uh, no oppositions uh, to this um, request. So we decided to go ahead and put it on the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the next uh, agenda item is agenda item number 17, Oceanfront Investments LLC for a street closure. Is there a representative for this item? Okay. Um, okay. We'll get there before we, get, before we vote. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the commission. My name is RJ Nutter. I'm an attorney. I represent Oceanfront Investments LLC. Thank you for placing us on the consent agenda. All five conditions are acceptable. Uh, we appreciate this. this. is a pretty simple one, thank goodness. And uh, again, thank you and thanks staff for all their hard work on this application. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there any opposition for this item to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, uh, we've asked Mr. Alcaraz to read this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. The applicant for agenda number 17 is requested a to close a small strip of right of way in order to install a freestanding monument style sign at the entrance to a hotel at the oceanfront. Specifically, the proposed street closure is necessary to allow for a legal placement of a freestanding sign at the primary entrance of the new Marriott Oceanside Hotel, the Cavalier Beach Club, and other associated establishments. <coughs> State code requires that private signs be placed on the same parcel as the establishment the sign represents. Otherwise, the sign is considered off-site and therefore prohibited by city code. If approved, the subject 420 square foot strip of land will be resubdivided to become part of the adjacent privately owned parcel. The request is consistent with the long range goals and the vision of the resort strategic growth area, SGA. The sign meets all applicable zoning requirements of the Oceanfront Resort District form based code and the city zoning ordinance and is consistent with the quality of the establishment it's advertising. Based on the, those conditions, staff recommends approval of the street closure and is recommended by the Planning Commission for approval for consent agenda. Thank you. The next item on the, uh, on the consent agenda is Festival LLC uh, for alternative compliance. Is there a representative uh, for this item? Thank you, Vice Chair Wald, uh, Chairman Weiner, members of the Commission. First of all, I appreciate you all letting me um, take a couple of uh, uh, seconds of time to, um, to address one of the conditions, as Ms. Moss indicated. But first, I want to great, express my great appreciation to Ms. Moss and to Plan Director Tahan, um, who have put in a great deal of time and effort in helping and listening and working with my clients uh, on this application. And also, thank the uh, uh, RAC PDRC for their endorsement of this request as well. Um, and with the caveat of the 
comments I'm going to make on condition number two, the first two sentences of condition number two, the 12 conditions as revised are acceptable to my clients. On condition number two, the first sentence concerning the wire-connected bollards, um, which are located entirely within the Pacific Avenue um, public right-of-way, um, these uh, bollards were present when my client purchased the property. Um, this parking area on the Pacific Avenue side of the property uh, was also uh, present and in use when uh, he purchased the property uh, and there was no landscaping whatsoever. Um, and this parking area had existed prior to our adoption of the form-based code as well. Um, my client has done a significant amount of landscaping and within the next 10 days is going to be doing a, a tremendous amount of additional landscaping and hopefully it will further um, obscure these um, bollards. Uh, my client was willing to paint them if it was possible, but they are so corroded um, and rusted and what have you, they're dangerous and you can't even get the wire out from between them. So uh, they're on city property and he has concerns about um, undertaking to remove them uh, and has been advised by separate counsel um, that that's not something that he should engage in. I'm not asking you to change the condition, but just want to put that on the record. Um, the sidewalk widening or with pavers on the second, con uh, second sentence is something that he's willing to, to potentially undertake, but the issues with having to treat stormwater in the public right of way on his site and uh, taking away development potential on his site, that will have to be addressed as we move forward through the uh, site plan process. And appreciate you all placing this matter on the consent mm -hmm. agenda. Be happy yeah. to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any opposition for the side to be on the consent agenda? Hearing none, we've asked uh, Mr. Alcaraz to read this into the record. Thank you, Mr. Wall. The subject property is home to the shack, a primarily outdoor uh, resort establishment with dining, entertainment, and outdoor recreational facilities that become popular with both visitors and residents. The establishment has grown and adapted over the years to host a variety of unique, temporary, but often reoccurring events, venues, including food trucks, open air markets, outdoor entertainment, festivals, and fundraisers. The Oceanfront District, excuse me, the Oceanfront Resort District form-based code provides flexible flexibility through the alternative compliance process to accommodate unique uses and development forms that contribute to the character and ambiance of the envision in the resort area strategic action plan. Uh, RASAP 2030, but do, not but do not follow the prescribed form as written in section 7.33 of the ordinance I just stated, provides the review standards for these applications, noting that the city council shall consider the extent to which the proposed development taken as a whole satisfies these standards. Each of these standards is listed on the report. And having said that, based on the conclusion, um, with the uses and the associated structures that satisfy the standards above the greatest extent possible, staff recommends approval of the special exemption of the alternative compliance to the form-based code. And I'm making sure I say this right, with the recommendations or revisions that Mr. Eddie Berdan just stated are, on the agenda, are, on, are put on the uh, consent agenda for approval. I believe the the applicant or Mr. Berdan has represented that he's not requesting any change to the conditions that were provided to you in the supplement, which was provided to you last night that had revisions to conditions one, three, five, and six. Okay. Pertaining to two, Mr. Berdan, are we good? Then I retract what I said, then I recommend approval on the consent agenda. Okay. As stated on the report. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you. All right, um, the, the Planning Commission also places the following applications for a conditional use permit for short-term rental on the consent agenda. Uh, as they meet the applicable requirements for section 241.2 of the zoning ordinance, staff and planning commission supports the applications and there are no speakers signed up in opposition. These include um, consent, um, Agenda item number 23, 26, and 28. Um, 
<clears throat> so, yep. That was the last item on the consent agenda. Okay. So with that being said, um, I, move, I move for approval of agenda items two, three, four, five, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 16, 17, 18, and on the short-term rental consent agenda, 23, 26, and 28. We have a motion by Mr. Wall. Do we have a second? second. I second. Second by Mrs. Klein, and I think we have a couple of abstentions here. Thank you, Chairman. Um, pursuant to the State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act, I make the following declaration. I am executing this written disclosure regarding the Planning Commission's discussion and vote on uh, agenda item 15, Derek and Nicole Howard. On agenda item 17, Oceanfront Investors. And agenda item 18, Festival LLC. Uh, the applicants have financing through Town Bank at 297 Constitution Drive, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23462, and I am on a committee at Town Bank. Uh, however, I am not involved in uh, any decisions made at the bank, nor do I have a direct financial interest in the bank. As such, I have made this disclosure and believe that I can participate in these trans, uh, uh, transactions fairly, objectively, and in the public interest, and will participate and vote on these items. Please record this declaration in the official records of the Planning Commission. Um, Thank you. And then uh, I have a, another okay. other okay. item here. Um, uh, I am making uh, this disclosure regarding the discussion and vote on the application of short-term rentals. These are agenda items 19 through 28. I am abstaining uh, because I believe until City Council has heard Planning Commission's recommendation uh, regarding short-term rentals in the Old Beach area, uh, as well as Planning Commission's recommendation regarding short-term rentals from the March uh, 20. 21 public hearing, uh, we should not hear another short-term rental. Uh, I believe this is necessary to provide guidance to the Planning Commission so that we are able to be consistent. Um, I do not have a conflict requiring me to abstain. Uh, a written disclosure of this uh, will be provided tomorrow for inclusion in the Planning Commission's formal record. I am a Planning Commission member for the Lynn Haven District. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Inman. Yes, uh, likewise, um, with regard to the Conflicts of Interest Act, um, I also am a member of the Virginia Beach Advisory Board of Town Bank and I make the following declaration uh, with regard to item 15, Derek and Nicole Howard. Item 17, Oceanfront Investments. Number 18, Festival LLC. Uh, and I've made this disclosure and believe I can participate in this application uh, and decision making fairly and objectively and in the public interest and I will participate and vote on those items. Thank you. Ms. Oliver. Um, pursuant to the State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act, I make the following declara declaration. I've chosen to abstain from discussing and voting on item number 18, the Festival LLC, 712 Atlantic Avenue, Virginia Beach, Virginia, on the 14th of April, 2021, Planning Commission agenda. I am party to a court case that is unrelated to this application, but a representative of the applicant is involved in the case, and I've chosen to abstain to avoid any appearance of conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Wall and a second by Mrs. Klein. You're ready to vote? Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? 
Aye. Chairman Weiner. Aye. By recorded vote of nine in favor and zero against, agenda items two, three, four, five, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 16, and 17 have been approved, recommended for approval by consent. Agenda item number 18, 23, 26, and 28 have with a recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against, and two of one abstention for each agenda item have been approved, recommended for approval by consent. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, thank you for those who've had items on the consent agenda. They will be scheduled in the future to be on city council agenda. Um, now we will move to the items that we will hear and the city, or Madam Clerk will take that, please. First item is agenda item number one, city of Virginia Beach, an ordinance to amend section 2-385 of the city code pertaining to the establishment of a short-term rental zoning permit. Hi there. Hi, Deputy City we know, Attorney. We know who you are. Deputy City Attorney Kay Wilson here for the city of Virginia Beach. Um, this would establish a $200 fee um, for each and every short-term record, short-term rental in the city to pay yearly. It also establishes that zoning is the responsible division and department that would um, do enforcement as well as any kind of control of STRs. And that prior to the issuance of any kind of permit, there would be an inspection to ensure that property is in full compliance with the short-term rental regulations. Now that may be by the renter himself or by um, a professional, depending upon which version of this is passed by city council. So that would be a $200 fee once a year for each one. Thank you. I think um, we had between most of us or some of us, we wanted to discuss this a little bit further. So um, I think, does anybody have any questions for Mrs. Wilson? I think we can, we'll just take it from here and close it out and do our little discussion. Who wants to start? <laughs> oh, George, you said you did? Yeah, I always get that. Okay. Well, I appreciate you letting me bring this up during the informal. Uh, I did kind of uh, get a little jumpy, antsy on that, and uh, I was informed what would happen. And so um, having said that, I just want to make sure the planning department has sufficient funds to do what they have to do. As Ms. Wilson, our legal help had just stated, um, zoning, it's for it's a fee for zoning um, uh, for inspections, but I think there's more to that. And I, I can see that uh, that more is going to, uh, uh, I'm just, I, I know where the planning department's going through right now and uh, I can just foresee some additional help that's gonna be needed. And uh, having stated what I said before, um, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, not approve this uh, application uh, for um, it's just uh, I don't think it's enough and I don't want to get into discussion on how much I just want it to go to City Council that um, I don't think it's enough leave it at that um, Mrs. Oliver. Yeah. I uh, would like to second George's motion as um, we've traveled long through the years with these STRs and we know that the staff is um, strained at best in managing the STRs. So um, with that, I think that they probably are gonna need more funding than is recommended. So I second the motion by George. Any other comments? Jack? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that the, the staff, you know, established something that was fair and reasonable um, you know, to initiate, um, you know, a, a fee that, that can help you know, develop their staff and and build a, a compliance um, strategy. I mean, I'm not necessarily opposed to increasing the fee, but I, I think that, you know, this initiates it and um, that they, they, can, they can propose a, a, a greater fee as, as, the, as time progresses, um, you know, as they see, see an expansion and, and need to develop their, more fully develop their staff. You know, I don't know if, if us just arbitrarily coming up with a number, which we didn't, but you know, to deny it just based on that, I, I don't know. I, I support that. I support this um, 
I kind of support it. Um, you know, I think it's it was you know done thoughtfully and um, so that's. Yeah, I'm sorry, thoughtfully. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's that's where I stand. Thanks. Um, any other comments? Yes. Yep. No, oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with with uh, Commissioner Wall. Um, basically, we we need the fee. We we need more than that. I agree. I, I agree with the concept that we need. It should be higher. But um, to not approve what what's been put. In, recommended for the budget or and that I understand is in the printed budget uh, I would want to jeopardize um, that now we don't have the final say council does but I think we can send our our message to council in other ways about our concerns about the amount being insufficient so I'm going to support the $200 fee most of mrs. Klein uh, I, f I find it somewhat offensive that we're asked to approve something that we were not allowed to have an input on, especially because they tirelessly ask for our input on other things. Um, I agree with George and Dee. I don't think that this, the $200 is uh, sufficient for the planning staff. Um, I think when you are the staff and you ask for money that people don't take you seriously as someone who's done that as a staff member, um, but as the, over, the, the overseeing body who deals with the community complaints that there's, not, there's no enforcement of the STR rules, we need to provide, we need to advocate for the staff and provide them with as much support as possible so that they can um, remedy that. So I will be supporting George's revised motion. Mr. Costin. I have one question, so if we choose not to approve this, does that mean that staff doesn't get anything until we hear back from city council and start all over again? Mrs. Wilson, do you want to weigh in? Okay. Um, no, if you, if you send up a recommendation for denial, it will be a recommendation for denial. Um, if you wish to change the, the, the monetary uh, fee from two to $500, what will happen and it can happen, I'm not telling you it can happen because I checked with the finance attorney. Um, so what happens is if council agrees with you, they will have to pull this item from the budget. In pulling this item from the budget, they will also have to pull the two FTEs that are um, supported by this money that, we, that planning would have gotten. So we'll pull all of that and then it will go back on the agenda for city council after it has been advertised again. All fees in the planning department have to be specifically advertised. I don't know whether you saw it, it's a little chart. It says where we get the authority, how much it's going up, all of those kind of things, but they have to be advertised separately. So they would, we would have to advertise that again it would need to go back to council for them to approve that as part of the budget and then for them to approve the FTEs. Well, do we have time for that before the budget gets approved? Because isn't that no, like next it will month? Be, no, it will be later on before we will see this item come back. To Not to you all, but to council. Okay. So it, based on that, I'd have to support it because I'd rather see them get what they're going to get than get nothing for next year. Mr. Horsley. Most of the town on, what, does your department dis determine how much money this should be? Where did this $200 come from? Mr. Horsley, we provided an analysis for the city manager for consideration of a fee between $200 to $250. Based on a modest increase in the number of short-term rentals uh, that would get approved, we anticipate between $400 and $450,000 to be generated based on these the current fee. Uh, that current fee does not only include uh, covering our uh, two additional full-time employees, but it also covers the the software program that we're that we have from a third party. So that is our funding source to pay for that uh, in the future. So you think the two hundred dollars is adequate? For now, yes. So we don't. Uh, we'll be honest. We're we're trying our best to build the program while it's in the midst of operating. So. We believe that there's enough room in there to have also uh, temporary employees to try to supplement our current employees. Thank you. 
based based on what's the town, I, I would have to support the motion because he, it appears that the planning staff has, we don't have the expertise to know how much about the finances, but we have to go on what they recommend. If they think they can make this work, I think uh, we have to support that. So you're supporting my motion or not? No. Okay. We, his. So can I, can I, I got, say something real quick? Okay. If Mr. Tan, I know my boring life, I watch y'all present stuff to council a lot. And if, but if this does pass, can you put in bold letters that we disagree with the amount of money and it should be more? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's, I mean, I don't think it's going to get to them that if we pass it or not pass it, it's still not going to get to them why. We really want to make sure it gets to, gets to them and why we did what we did. It is clear based on the um, discussion that's going on right now that uh, that information will be included in the agenda request okay. form, which is provided in front of the staff report for this item. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Sir, yeah. I want to ask Ms. Wilson something, if you don't mind. If um, if I if I substitute a motion or or revise it and say that there's an increase on the next fiscal year, does that does that go into this budgets? If I say twenty percent, um, it wouldn't be binding. You can't bind a future council, okay, um, in any way. Um, but I would like to tell you too, it will not go in with a sheet in front of it. It will go in the budget, the budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where it'll be. It, there won't be a page that says this should be whatever. It'll go in a budget budget book. We revise. Yes, Mrs. Klein. Mr. Dehan, if we were to recommend denial of this or this ordinance, would that cause your department more difficulty? Yes, <laughs> I'll just. You don't. You don't get what you're getting. Okay. The revision. Yes, Mr. I, I would say that the the, uh, the verbatim of our discussion, council's going to get that, and they're going to mm -hmm. see that that we all think that that this problem this probably not enough money, but we, since it's what we've been given, we you know we, I guess in staff says that they can make that work now. That, but we can uh, reiterate from our verbatim to council that that they understand that we need we think that they in an upcoming year we think they will need more money. Because I agree that staff is really, I mean it's been a big strain on them over the past twelve months to to uh, make make this stuff this stuff work and uh, I, I agree. Thank you. Well, we can go the George's motion. Or we need a substitute motion. Or can we revise the motion? I'll remove my motion. Okay. Turn, I'm turning my. I'm absolutely with okay with withdrawing my second on George's motion. Thank you. Now you, you're clear. Okay. You need a motion. Now we need a motion, please. Somebody. Uh, I'll do it. Yes, Mr. Emin. Yeah. Or, Mr. Uh, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, increase in, in or the passage of the ordinance that provides for a fee to operate the uh, uh, other staff needed by the planning department. Right. I'll second. Second. Now we have a motion by Mr. Emmett, a second by Mr. Alcrez, or Mr. Borsley, sorry. All right, ready to vote? Aye. Mr. Alcrez? Mr. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Since I abstained from voting on the short-term rental sh short uh, agenda items. Am I abstaining from this? I abstain. Okay. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By a recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against, and one abstention, agenda item number one has been recommended for approval. Thank you. Next item is item number seven. Uh, agenda item number seven, Robin Gothier, an application for a conditional use permit group home on property located at 1593 Lynnhaven Parkway located in the Centerville District. 
I believe that we have the applicant's representative as a virtual speaker. Okay. I'm calling Joe Bushy. If you would wait two to three seconds and then begin your comments. I was just available to address any questions that the planning commission may have. I wasn't signed up to speak on this behalf, on behalf of this application. Hold on, hold on one second, sir. One second, please. Um, that was the, that was the applicant's representative. Yeah. Um, let's call here. Tom Snyder, Thomas Snyder, who is also virtual. Mr. Snyder, if you would wait two to three seconds. Welcome, sir. We thought you were, we, we thought you were virtual. I am. Yeah. In front of you. <laughs> Hologram, right? How, how are you? Uh, my name is Tom Snyder. Um, I'm a local attorney in Virginia Beach. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of Samaritan House, uh, who is the applicant for a conditional use permit for a group home uh, on a approximately two acre parcel of land um, on, off of Lynn Haven Parkway. Um, my client is going to develop a group home for people who are subject to human trafficking uh, to be servicing those people here in Virginia Beach. Uh, Samaritan House, as some of you may know, also provides other kinds of services for people who are subject to domestic uh, violence. And um, as a part of its mission, this mission creep, so to speak, occurred, and the opportunity was provided to us to provide this additional service. Um, just so you know, this is a, the people who are subject to human trafficking have unique problems. It's a much more intensive issue to deal with and that requires a specialized facility. This, there's, to our knowledge, there's only one group home which has been in the process of being developed in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, if this will probably be the second and the first to maybe become the first, which will actually become operational. We have uh, located the property, uh, the building on the property in a manner that uh, we think will allow for potential uh, expansion of this facility uh, as the need potentially grows. Uh, the property we are buying from the adjoining church, which is uh, a unique church because it's owned by both the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church, and both of them have enthusiastically supported the mission of what we are trying to accomplish and recognize the need for it uh, in the Commonwealth. I do want you to see, if you look at the site plan, which is on, your, on the screen in front of me, um, you'll see that we have recently discovered the adjoining property owner, which is a Montessori school, has um, um, raised some concerns. Um, there's a couple of things you should notice about that. Number one, the property line for the property that we are purchasing actually is, in the Montessori school is actually encroached on uh, the property owned by the church, and that's about 3,500 square feet. Um, and, but what we have done is you'll see that we have, there's actually a fence and a landscaping line that we have uh, proposed that would provide a both security and a screening from the Montessori school. And so that, we tried to address that issue proactively. Um, and put that in to our application, uh, I think just yesterday. So um, I have Ms. Robin Gauthier here with me as well. She's the executive director of Samaritan House. She is extremely knowledgeable about this entire project 
if there would be any questions that you would have concerning um, what we are going to be doing. She would be probably a better person than myself. I will tell you this, most of the people who are going to be occupying this facility, I think there's seven or eight bedrooms. It's about 5,000 square feet. Uh, there's, they're probably almost all gonna be young girls between the ages of something like 14 and 17 years of age. Um, they are, uh, there's, there's on staff people 24 seven that will be there. Robin can give you the, the really the, the nuts and bolts of what the program would entail and, and what the, the efforts of what would be uh, under what we would be trying to do to, to help these people to be able to become uh, you know, functioning members of society, so to speak, and to overcome whatever, most of them will have had a, a very serious um, history in terms of trying to deal with. So um, are there, I, know, I know there's three minutes and I don't want to over, overspend my time. So. You get 10. Pardon me? You get 10. Oh, I get 10? Yes. Oh, well, okay. Well, I'm sitting here thinking I only have <laughs> three minutes. I'm waiting for some but light think, or something to but tell I, me. I will tell you, well, there is somebody, in, I believe there is, we have one speaker in opposition. Yes. So let them talk and, and let's see what they have to say. And if you want to come back up to address anything that, okay. that they have to say. Thank We'd you, love to back up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. How about Robin first? Do you want to talk? Do you, hold, on, hold on one second. Do we want to? Could we hear from the executive director first? Sure. Okay. Uh, about fine. the details of the program. Okay. Or, sure. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, Please state your name for the record. Robin Gauthier, Thank you. executive director of Samaritan House. The program will actually serve five to eight youth ages nine to 17. Um, and so we don't know if we'll have, you know, eight beds filled all the time, but there's the potential to have eight youth um, to be served. Um, and so, you know, the services are going to be educational services, trauma-informed counseling, case management, mental health, substance abuse, anything that's needed for these girls. We've been rescuing victims of human trafficking since 2016. In the Hampton Roads Human Trafficking Task Force, we were a major part in bringing those funds to uh, the Hampton Roads area. And so what we did not realize in 2016 is we'd be finding so many youth, um, many of them in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Chesapeake, um, Hampton, Newport News, in our region. So unfortunately, because there's no facility for youth, uh, oftentimes the law enforcement or Homeland Security or FBI will have to bring them to juvenile detention to at least they will have a safe place to stay away from the trafficking and away from the streets. But we know what they really need is a residential home like this with medical facilities, um, you know, where they can get all the services they need. There is a runaway youth shelter that's available, but it's a 90-day program, and it, there's really not the services that they need. Um, and so at Samaritan House, we've seen about 18 kids this year that we've been working with. Um, as case managing them, but they are either at home in juvenile detention in a group, another type of group home, or they were um, in foster care. So we really need a facility like this um, for our region and for our task force because we're continuing to find children uh, that need to be rescued. And a lot of hotel motels in this area where we're finding them, and being that we're a resort area, we're finding a lot of youth that are trafficked. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Chairman Weiner, we have a speaker signed up. They're supposed to be virtual. However, they have not signed on. So I'm going to call them to see if they showed up in person. Rolando and Judith Tim. Welcome, ma'am. Please state your name for the record. Judith Tim. The proposed facility, Samaritan House, to be built next door to Courthouse Montessori School is a house 
that is going to house a group of young students, nine through 17 was what I was given on the telephone. These girls have been traumatically sexually abused by sex traffickers. Although I appreciate the work that Samaritan House is planning to do for these girls, I'm confident that that particular type of group home being next door to a school is extremely detrimental to our business and the school situation. We have been in operation for 27 years at this location. We cater to the military, to medical personnel, and to the general public. Our school is open daily from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to accommodate these people. We range in, our children range in age from 16 months old through 12 years old. They're at a very impressionable, vulnerable, and inquisitive age. The dangers associated with this type of group home right next to Courthouse Montessori School would cause con concern to our parents for their children and for us for our students. As a result, we would begin to lose families. Our school would end up not being available. I'm responsible for keeping these children safe, and I don't feel comfortable with this group home being built close to our school. And I'm certain the parents would share this concern. I have not mentioned it to them. We are strongly opposed to this group home being built beside our school, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, ma hold on one second. Do you have a question? No, okay. Okay. My name is Rolando Tim. Um, came originally from Chile 58 years ago. One of my goals with my wife was to participate in the education of children. My wife has a, several degrees in, Ma in Montessori and it's a very unusual and very excellent system. We have generated literally thousands of children that have come through our school that when they go into the real world, do a positive job in their personal morality and their personal stance. Now, I realize that th this needs there's a need for a place like the Samaritan House, but to place it right in the middle of a family-oriented place with a school right next to it poses all kinds of problems. I know there can be all kinds of assurance that there will be people involved, I'm sure, but the people associated with this uh, traumatized young people are not going to just sit by and let them go by. And the exposure that we are being put into is the same exposure like somebody will tell you, you're safe in your house, but if you call 911, you may be put in hold for 15 minutes. So this is the sort of thing that is unpredictable. And we feel very upset about having this because our children in a playground right next to this place can hear all kinds of things that you and I and other people cannot prevent from happening. So my personal position, as much as I like to support all kinds of charities and I do many other good works for young people, I would not want to see that next to us. What is going to probably happen if it does, I'm going to be forced to sell the building and move to another location somewhere, which at this point, I don't know where that'd be. And we will be probably severely penalized in the selling of the property because of the existence of this uh, house right next door. Thank you very much. I appreciate your concern.
And, uh, hold on one second, sir. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Question. Ms. Oliver has a question for you. Sir, as I, I appreciate your um, perspective on this, I'm just curious as to what impact do you, that you are anticipating from these young girls onto the school. What do you perceive happening? Well, unfortunately, it's not the young girls I'm concerned about it. It's the girls that these girls were associated with. We have in this country a horrific problem in that regard. It would not have a handle of it. The trafficking in young women and so whatnot is well known, and yet we haven't controlled it. We don't have a control over it. And so the people associated with this girl in the past probably is not going to just sit back and let it go by. They're going to search for it, and we have very little uh, way to defend ourselves for it. So if I understand you correctly, then what you are concerned about is that the sex traffickers coming to find the girls yes. to get them back, and then possibly there's your school. We're dealing in an unknown. Nobody can give me any assurance, oh, that will never happen. No, if you watch TV frequently enough, you see that horrific things like that can happen. And, 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 and the police and the law enforcement agencies have very little power because they have to wait for something to happen before they can do anything about it. And then the, the rest of the story, you know what will take place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want you to know that my wife and I, in 27 years, have put a tremendous amount of effort into having the very best type of school for our young children. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. There are no more speakers. Please. Okay. Do you want to come back up and address anything, please? So I, I do understand the, the fear of the unknown, and I, I talked to Mrs. Timms for quite some time. I didn't know they were in opposition until yesterday. It was the first time I heard from them. I thought they were calling because they wanted to support it, actually. Um, I do understand the fear of the unknown, but to put it in perspective, um, these girls are so replaceable so quickly. Traffickers don't go after them. It's not personal. They're a commodity to them. They sell them and they go get 10 more. It's not like in domestic violence where they want that specific person or that specific child because it's theirs and they want ownership. In human trafficking, women and children are a commodity. They're sold. When you go into a massage parlor and you arrest you know, a bunch of women in a massage parlor, there's 10 more coming in on an airplane. So traffickers don't want these specific children. It's not personal to them. They're a piece of property. So I think it's a little, um, a little irrational to think these traffickers are going to be coming to the house after these girls and disturbing the, the children at the school, or that these children that we have, they're children, they're minors, are going to be disturbing the children. I was hoping Marshall would put up the picture. We, we added a privacy fence. From the school looking over to the property, you can't even see the, the facility. You can't even see the children. Um, and our fence is going to be much higher than theirs. And it would divide the whole property line. Because who knows what else could be built in that property um, in the future. But there would be a privacy fence the whole way down. So you couldn't even see one facility to the next. Those children couldn't even see our children. Our children couldn't see their children. Um, the facility will have security. Uh, there will be beeps on the doors. People can't come in without being beeped in. Um, there'll be a foyer uh, where people have to be beeped in. So I, I understand the concern, though I want to make sure it's realistic. Um, there's not going to be men out there or traffickers out there going after these girls. With all 18 children that we have served this year, no one has ever been 
taken back or pulled back, and they weren't even in a secured facility. They were either in foster care or in their home or places like that. I, I do understand the, the fear of what someone thinks because it's a very scary thing. Um, but law enforcement, I, I just have to say, law enforcement, Homeland Security, FBI, they do a great job. And they are at our beck and call in minutes. They bring someone to Samaritan House who's an adult. And if we need them, we do safety planning. And they're in the community and in, in, in homes. And they are at our beck and call because we're helping them with the victim that they rescued. And they want that, vic that victim to help prosecute in a case against a trafficker. So they're very close by. Um, so I, I just don't see the, the fear as, as, as deeply as they do. And I understand it, it's their school and their property and their children. They're trying to protect them. I told them we would do everything we could to work with them. Um, so we added that privacy fence. Could we move the, the, the property over to the left a little further towards the church? Because the church doesn't mind at all. Um, they, they wanted to do this project. They want to give back to the community. So could we move it over to the other side? Absolutely. We want to be good neighbors. We know we're going to be neighbors for a long time. So whatever we can do to help accommodate with, with trees and shrubbery and fences and and moving of the building, it's going to be costly, but it's not so costly that we can't afford to do that in the project. So could we put the building closer to the other side? Absolutely. If that would help assuage their fear, we're willing to do that. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Yep. George? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Go. Someone else? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Ms. Gother, how um, many other safe havens or group homes do you have currently now? We have no group homes for children. That's safe why havens. it's a gap. We have 14 homes for adults. So if it's a child, I think an 18-year-old is still a child, 18 and over, they can come into any of our 14 safe shelters that we have in communities. But if they find a minor under the age of 18, you have to be in a licensed facility. And this will have oversight by Department of Behavioral Health. It'll have a licensing involved. And staff will be 24-7. There'll never be anyone there without a staff member. So they have to be there 24-7. And you've never had any problems before with any of those safe havens okay thank no, you thank no. you mr costin uh, will the children that you'll be aiding go to school or will they be there all day or some will go to public school and some will be homeschooled it really depends on the situation and how deeply they're affected and what their needs are so some children um, who have not been in this situation for a long time and don't have the deeper level of trauma might just go to school and be fine Others may need to be homeschooled, and so we'll have a classroom there, and we'll have, we have teachers and people to help with homework and things like that. So we, we're going either direction, and that has to be in, approved by your license. Mr. Whitney, Mr. Graham. Will there be any, well, I guess turn, your mic, turn your mic on. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I, th I was, I'm a little confused because at one point um, I thought staff said that the building couldn't be shifted to the south because um, maybe it was sewer. There was a it was It's going to be more costly to shift it because they're going to have to tie into sewer and water further away from the building. But like I, I told Ms. Timms yesterday, if that would make her feel more secure to have the building further over. I mean, I have our engineer on, on call. Um, right now, he can answer those questions. It can be shifted. It's just going to be costly. Well, is that because there's not enough fall with the sewer, or is it because there's it's more further pipe? away? Because it's I further away. It's so further it's just away. a distance thing. So it's just additional yes. pipe. Yes. Okay. So that's that's yes. that's that's not as costly as um, correct as if there wasn't enough depth or fall. Yeah. Um, and, and the way the p the building is positioned too, I think. Well, I'm not sure. I, I would have to let the engineer. Yeah, speak. he did it in a way they they positioned the site plan in a way to make it easy for building. Okay, but you could absolutely move it to the south a little bit. And okay. I and I told Miss Timms that we would work with her if that would make them feel better and feel safer. We would we would gotcha. do that. Is, is there any security? Um, I understand, um, you know, from what you're saying that it's not personal. Uh, yeah. These these people, you know, that that do the sex trafficking or yeah. trafficking of, of of humans, they you know, they just go get new ones. I guess there's an endless unfortunately, supply. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately um, that's true. 
So, but do you have any security? Will you have to have any kind of security there? Like a we don't feel like a, a security guard is necessary because security guards aren't armed. They really can't do much anyway. I mean, right. calling 911 is probably the best way to deal with it, but we don't, honestly, I mean, it, I guess it's a possibility someone could come to the house, but we don't anticipate that being an issue. And Got we it. have so many staff going in and out and case managers and counselors and people that are there and... Like Homeland Security, they come several days a week to our office because they're interviewing clients and they're there all the time and they're very involved with the case. Generally, either the perpetrator is in jail or the perpetrator is on their radar and they're doing an investigation. So when it comes to a minor being victimized, usually the perpetrator's in jail by the time they get rescued and they come to us. So that's another reason why I see less of a fear, you know. Um, with of somebody coming back, yeah. Um, yeah, typically they're they're in jail, and if you've if you've seen all the prosecutions we've gotten um, in the last couple of years since the task force has started, we've gotten many prosecutions where people have gotten 15, 20, even 40 years uh, prison time for the trafficking. Gotcha. Um, so where will the the um, the kids, the girls, where will they yeah. hang out outside? Where, where, is there going to be an, an area where they can hang out or is yeah through with our licensing guidelines we have to have a recreation room inside which so okay. we have a recreation room inside and then in the back we have a porch that's going to be like a screened in sunroom type area um i suppose they'll go outside in the backyard sometimes but that's not typically going to be part of the you know that's not part of their day-to-day -day routine um, we'll be we'll take them on field trips. They're not going to be locked up. They're not the criminals here. They're the victims. Right, they're the victims. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not going to be locked up. We're not going to chase kids down and wrangle them. It's a voluntary program. If they want to be there, they're welcome to stay there. We want to provide services. If they don't want to be there, they can leave. So if they want to leave, they can leave. They can leave. We're not chasing kids down. And if they're in a situation where there's juvenile justice, then they're going to be in juvenile detention. So if they're any criminal activity or things regarding them being a runaway or things like that, that's usually how they end up in juvenile detention. So these are the kids that really need to be rescued and need a place to go temporarily until Child Protective Services figures out what they're going to do with them or if they're going to return to family or how the situation is going to resolve itself. Really depends on each case. Each case is so very different. Yeah. Okay. All right. Th thank you very much. Thank you well, for the question. Um, I've got just a couple. Uh, so, so you mentioned plain. You know, do they, is it English as a second language for some of them? or uh, Most of the sex trafficking that's happening in this area is domestic. Only 5% of our cases have been foreign nationals. Okay. Okay. Um, and looking at, looking at the site, it's kind of an interesting site because there's a, a trail. The fence is just going to, your planned fence is only going to be on one side. Is that correct? It's, well, Somewhere. we added that to, to b totally block the us from the mm -hmm. school. We added that high privacy fence. That's what I, I was hoping Marshall would show the picture right. of what it looks like for a person. They'll only see the very tip of the school. They won't see anything mm -hmm. on the property and the children can't see it's each six child. Foot high. Six, six, six foot high, high privacy foot. fence along the whole property from the very end to the very. Cause it looks like there's a, um, a paved trail behind the property that um, parallels the, the creek in the back. I'm not sure what the traffic is. Yeah, I don't the know. Traffic's what that is. not the right word, but the um, pedestrian, you know, access back there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That goes to the the community pool. It connects to the community pool. So, I mean, there's a lot of. I'm not sure how much, but there's certainly public access on the back side. Um, I'm not sure. You know what? Thought it was a creek back there. There's a creek, but I um, mean, you know, just looking at the aerial and even in yeah. your survey, it shows a. Um, a paved trail on the backside. Well, we have no problems putting up a fence there either. Yeah, well, that's... If, if that's that will make people feel better, we're happy to put up a fence. Right, and that's not my point. My point is that the, no matter what, there's going to be public access. There's public access right now, and there's going to be pedestrians. You know, I'm not... Just pointing that out. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that the school already is aware of you know, the access back there. Um, it's probably more... Um, it's probably heavier than any any kind of activity that's going to be, you know, around the, the school. 
What about the entrance? Did, have you talked to the engineer about um, the location of your, your driveway? Um, you know, maybe the building might be in the, you know, in the centered in the property, but possibly the entrance on the other side towards the church as opposed to um, towards the school. Is that, would yeah, that can, be a possibility that can you they can, can they open his mic so that he can answer that? He's on. Joe Bushy, he was. Mr. Bushy, if you would wait two to three seconds and begin your comments. Okay, yes, um, that is a possibility. We can put the parking lot on the other side of the building. We don't see any problem with that. The, uh, typically, when you're locating a parking lot, you want to put it on the side of the building where you're not approaching the building, but that, that's, uh, there's no problem with doing it on the other side as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Graham? Um, Mr. Boucher, can the building shift 25 feet to the south? Um, let's say you kept the parking on the same side of the building. Um, could you shift the building to the south 25 feet and shift the driveway to the south 25 feet, creating a larger buffer between the Montessori school and the, um, the, uh, the, this project, this building? Yes, you, yes, you can do that. There's uh, no issue with doing that. Like Robin had pointed out, it's just going to be um, some additional sanitary sewer because where we have to tie in the existing sanitary sewer manhole is near where the property line is being proposed um, on the north end of the property, but that it shouldn't be a problem being able to run the sanitary, the additional length to get to that point. I don't believe he heard. There's you. enough, the depth is okay? The depth, is he gone? We still have to confirm the depth, but, um, and we'll do that when we get into the actual design. So we'll have to confirm that it is deep enough. That hasn't been done yet. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Graham, I, the only point that I would like to come say. Up, come up to the microphone, please, yeah. sir. Oh, Thanks. yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah yes, the only sir. point that I would like to say is that when you do shift the building, and if you just, just move it over 25 feet, I mean, there is, it's one point almost well, it's actually a little bit less than two acres now because the Montessori school is actually encroached on the property that we're buying by 3,500 square feet. And so as a result of that, I just don't, we, we are looking for this to potentially be other uses there. And so this was not, I mean, we, we're starting off with a 5,000 square foot uh, facility and you know it could be a larger facility at some point in time in the future. So we, we do want to preserve as much flexibility as possible for potential further utilization of the property. That's all. No problem. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And I was just thinking of, of the, of the you know, trying to get the Montessori school comfortable as well. Yeah, okay. I mean, we could put administrative offices back there. You know, the, the future may not be more client services. The future may be administrative offices back there, so we even have more oversight. So, you know, we could potentially have three buildings there, but it, if we center that and put it in, in a location that we can't build other buildings, it would restrict us from being able to use the full, you know, 1.9 acres, so. All right, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, any more speakers? No more speakers. Okay. Ma'am, I'm sorry, we, we have a procedure and we all we all had our time to talk, okay? Um, Ms. Klein, well, hold on a second. Mr. Inman over here wants to start off here, if you don't mind. Okay, we're gonna close this out and open it up to us for discussion. Mr. Inman would like. Thank you, Mr. Weiner. I just wanna um, say I come to this with an interesting perspective, having served 30 years on the board of Seton Youth Shelters which is the facility I think Robin was referring to probably that has some experience with sex trafficking um, situations. We 
Um, Seton Youth Shelters, for those of you who don't know, is a home for runaway uh, and throwaway children. Um, so I'm familiar with the fact that we have in that facility um, have housed uh, girls that have been subject to sex trafficking. Not only that, we have two shelters. One's a boys' shelter, one's a girls' shelter. Uh, and, and there's been boys as well. So, um, the, the, the history of this is really, really, I think, very telling uh, in terms of how, how this goes. Uh, when Seton Youth Shelters was started, we had just uh, girls. Uh, and we were on a site of a church, uh, church, the uh, St. Nicholas Catholic Church in Kings Grant. Um, and frankly, that went very well. Uh, we didn't have any trouble with the neighbors or neighborhood or uh, children going to, going to uh, uh, Sunday school, being interfered with by our residents. Again, we are a licensed facility. We are, have staff there 24-7. And then there came a time when we wanted to um, allow, the first shelter was established for girls, the second shelter was established in the late 90s for boys. And we were blessed by having a site at, at the um, St. Aidan's Episcopal Church it offered us a site similar to this situation. It was a par parcel on their church site, which they really weren't using, didn't have any plans for, and they allowed us to build a shelter there on the corner of Kings Grant Road and Edinburgh Drive. It's there now. Uh, due to objections from neighbors, I was persuaded at that time by uh, a city council person to please move the girls to that new shelter because that might alleviate the concerns of the neighbors about having such a shelter close to them. We did that. and. Um, the interesting thing was a lot of the people that were objecting when they were told that there was a boys' shelter a half a mile up the road, they had no idea. Never heard anything bad about that. No. Um, <clears throat> so we now been there since uh, that shelter's been open since 1998. We and, and truly, of course, in recent years, the sex trafficking problem has, uh, has grown and we didn't have that much uh, sex trafficking uh, victims in, in our facility until maybe four or five years ago. But we have, and um, we've not experienced anything uh, where we had people circling the building trying to, uh, trying to make contact with these young people that were being housed for us. Now, we're a 90-day facility, so we need this. We need this. Um, it's a great opportunity that Samaritan House is offering to do this. I don't think it poses any, any risk that the fears that people have. We actually had people come to a hearing on the girls' shelter asking if we were going to put bars on the windows to keep them in. We said, no, they want to be there. They came here. They, they want help. They, 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 if they want to leave, they can leave, but they, they, they really need help. They want help, and, and they're, they're not going to, you know, need have any, have any bars on the windows. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we have going here. You know, we, we have victims that want help and are thankful for it, I'm sure. And um, moving this, this building over 25, 50 feet, I don't think that's going to do a thing to alleviate anybody's the, the concern that these folks have. They've, they've expressed an extraordinary concern about their, their property. I, 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 I'm hoping that I'm telling this story is helping them to understand that the risk that they fear is not, uh, I, I don't think, personally, in my experience, is not real. Um, the impact on their property values uh, and, and so forth. But uh, I, I wouldn't hate to see having to sacrifice any money to moving the house for, for purposes of um, uh, a buffer even, a, a greater buffer, bearing in mind that uh, the offer that has been made and will be committed to, by, I'm sure, by Samaritan House to put up 
you know, fence the, the uh, shrubbery uh, and so forth to create as much of a barrier and visual barrier and physical barrier uh, as could could be desired. So uh, I don't see anything wrong with the application. Thank you. Ms. Klein? I have to read something first. Uh, pursuant to the State and Local Government Conflicts of Interest Act, I make the following declaration. Uh, I am executing this written disclosure regarding the Planning Commission's discussion on vote number seven, uh, Robin Gauthier in the Catholic Diocese of Virginia, 1593 Lynn Haven Parkway, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, this property is located in the Green Run Homes community. I also reside in the Green Run Homes community and am on the Homeowners Association board for the community located at 1248 Green Garden Circle, Virginia Beach, Virginia. I've been informed by the city attorney's office that I have no personal or financial conflict and can vote on this application. Therefore, I will participate in the vote or discussion of this matter at today's meeting. Um, so that being said, <laughs> the bulk of my career has been spent in family violence and child abuse. <clears throat> I can tell you that those are the hardest facilities to get into um, from a security standpoint with their locked doors when they don't have a security officer. Um, I can't even pick up my son from childcare without a photo ID and they know me. So I believe the Samaritan House team when they say that this is going to be a secure facility and that only known people will be able to um, be let in. Um, through my work with the Child Advocacy Center at CHKD and in family violence, I can't stress the importance of having this in the community. Um, I have worked at community-based facilities such as this. Um, and so I absolutely appreciate the concerns of Courthouse Montessori. Um, in my experience, they are typically unfounded. And uh, like Mike said, most people don't even know that they exist if they're in a row, in like a set of row homes. Um, I'm grateful to the Samaritan House for taking the responsibility. Um, she, uh, Robin came to a board meeting and answered any questions that came up among the Green Run board because we will be working in tandem with them. Um, and uh, they have the board's full support uh, moving forward. And so um, I will absolutely be voting in favor of this application. Right. Who else? Ms. Carson? Uh, during my service in the fire department, I had the pleasure of inspecting the two places that Mr. Inman spoke of, uh, as well as the Judeo-Christian outreach over on 13th to 14th Street another place on Lynn Haven Parkway, all over the city. And uh, I've never seen any of those types of problems that we're fearing here today. Uh, they're all well run by professional staff. Uh, uh, even when the kids were wayward, the staff was adequate for the situations they had to deal with. Uh, so I'll be supporting it as well. Jack? Um, I feel this is a very low intensity use. Um, you know, there's a low risk you new know, to the impacts to neighbors uh, fully or further mitigated by, by landscaping and, and fence. So, um, so I'm gonna be in support of this application also. All right, anyone else have a motion? Ms. Klein? Uh, I move to... Approve the application uh, for Robin Gauthier and the Catholic Diocese of Richmond. All right, we have a, a motion by Mrs. Klein. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Uh, Mr. Uh, um, Inman, go ready to vote. Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner. Aye. By recorded vote of nine in favor, zero against, agenda item number seven has been approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go to item number eight. Okay. Agenda item number eight, Martha H. White, an application for a subdivision variance, section 4.4B of the subdivision regulations, 
on property located at 6332 Pocahontas Club Road, located in the Princess Anne District. Would the applicant or the applicant's representative please step to the podium? Welcome, sir. Please say your name. My name is Harold Warren. Um, I'm with the Land Surveying Company of Warren and Associates, and been here to support uh, Miss White, who's here. This is uh, basically we're tidying up the estate. One of the Miss um, White's sister, Betty Styron, um, she's uh, willing to in her part of the estate and. And um, by by letting her um, by letting her daughter continue to live at this home, um, um, we've agreed with uh, Marshall that a little change in a note would be perfect on a subdivision plot, and I don't think we have any anybody has a problem with it with the plan. So. Um, Any questions on it or Mr. Torsen? Harold, what is the change you want to put into no. Uh it's just a simple a uh, change to that if we were to put the property back in its orig original configuration, we could actually tear down the existing house there and move it over to a a, a part of the property that's out of the flood zone. So that's it's, it's in other words, in other words, just what you're saying is if we, if the if two pieces the two pieces of property end up in one ownership, and they wanted to remove the home to Sarah and build one more build another home on the spot that's that meets the uh, ordinance. Yeah, elevation and whatever. You, yeah, you like. to get the property out of the flood zone. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a it's a much, why they put this home over there. I'm not quite sure, but. Um, uh, we're, we've agreed that if you if we're allowed to do the the four point four and a half acre track of land, we'll never put an anything another residential unit on the on the other parcel. It's, but I wanted to put a note in there that if somebody was able to come buy the land and possibly uh, remove the the line the the new subdivision line between the properties that. We could actually put put a new house on that the twenty five acre track. So that's. Let me. Can I ask Mr. Town yes. a question? Go ahead. I think that's the same one. Bobby, if if that if that were to happen, if in, in the future somebody went there, or if one or if the lady that owns a four and a half acre piece uh, that they should be getting the the daughter, if she ended up with the whole property, just for, just for example. And they wanted to remove that house. They would have to remove the lot, have the lot line. They'd have to still have to go to council or come to planning and have the lot line removed. And they could uh, petition to build a home on another location as long as it met the elevation and whatever. I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but um, no, let, I'm asking Mr. Mr. Tahan. So. The subdivision variance right now would be to create the two substandard lots based on the um, amount of wetlands that are located on the property and they don't meet the criteria. If they were to put the properties back together and I'm, I'm trying to look at it now, I don't, I don't think I have. Um, the existing property itself now does not meet the minimum stand, minimum acreage of property over uh, outside of the water marsh wetlands or the floodplain of special restrictions. So uh, there's, I understand their point that they want to main, be able to maintain the ability to build one residence on the lot if they ever put it all back together. Uh, there is one residence on the lot now. Um, staff doesn't disagree with, with that approach. Uh, we believe we can come up with a revised condition. Uh, but again, the key is, is that on this parcel, this whole parcel, there will, regardless of what it is, it's either it's going to only uh, be allowed to have one residence. Yeah, well, I think I think that's understood. It'll only be one residence, but I think what Mr. Mr. Harold is wanting to do is, if somebody ended up with the whole parcel, could they move? Could they build a do away with that house and build it on another location? 
Currently, the way it's the way it's worded now, they could not. Could not. Yes, that's correct. Can that wording be changed to satisfy that? Make that. I believe we can. Um, our concern, of course, is that we're creating the larger lot, which does not meet the requirements. So we don't want to, in the future, let's say, uh, it never comes back together, mm -hmm. that no residence is built on that lot. Absolutely. Um, I'm having trouble. I'm having trouble knowing how to say both, right? Because right. Uh, we need on the plat when we create it that that one lot is not buildable. Um, uh, the the condition we have is uh, we do have something written up. I just need to make sure I run it by the city attorney to see if we're on the same page um, and that we can do both. It may be that we add a third condition to the to the proposal that could cover the ability if they put it back together, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Can I say something real quick? It, so no matter what, if the, this house gets torn down and, and they go to build a new house, no matter what, it still has to come back to planning. I, I think the applicant is requesting that it doesn't have to come back as oh, far as the subject. Is that what you're saying? It doesn't yes. have to come uh, back. You know, this is kind of expensive, and um, it will only ever have, the whole parcel will only ever have one residential unit just like it is now. If we were to vacate the, uh, the lot line we create, um, I'm just asking that we can only have one house there and put it in a different spot on the lot that's more favorable flood zone wise and soil. Mr. Horsley, how do you feel about that? I mean, I, I see what he's saying. I, you know, the, the likelihood of that happening, you know, is, is kind of far fetched, but um, it, I guess it could happen. And I just, I think Harold's thinking that if he uh, puts that opportunity there, it would make, make the property may, maybe a little bit more valuable or something. I'm not, not sure. I see. It, it does not preclude them to come back to amend the subdivision variance as well. If they put the property back together and they come back through the process, uh, of course, staff would be supportive of putting it back the way it was. But the hard part for us is we want to make sure we hold firm on the ability that we're not creating a lot. Just one lot. Yeah, th right. If, right now, we're creating a lot that doesn't meet the minimum criteria uh, in either direction, right? <laughs> so we, we just want to make sure that we're we're capturing that, and I'm sorry, I'll stop my comments. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, C couldn't the subdivision plat simply have a note on the, the provision on it that says there'll be only one house on, pick your, I mean, so many words, pick your lot, but it's only one house, and when you, you can, there, there can only be one house on the two lots. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's, it's real close. I know there's a way to say it, but the, <laughs> the, the idea being that you know, you, if the, on the total property, there can only be one house. It can be on either lot, but not at the same time. There's a way to say that if, on a plat if you had it. Wouldn't, wouldn't that, if you could, wouldn't that solve the problem? I never think the best thing to do is go go with it like it is, and if if that uh, that situation happens, that applicant would come back and request planning to uh, do away with the lot line, and let, and they built moved because it'd be only one dwelling on the 30 acres to start with, and then that that, uh, that would have to come back through here. It'd be a cleaner way to do it, I think, if we did that, and then they could have that lot line dissolved, and uh, then they could build the house on another site. Is that the cleaner way to do it, Mr. Don? Yeah, yes, Mr. Horsley, that is the cleaner way. I think so. Harold, I think that's really the cleaner way. Okay. It's, it's going to probably co cost somebody a little bit of money in 15 and 20 years, but you and I won't be here to bother that. So. <laughs> Come on now. I think, but, I, but I, I think the goal now is to get it so that people, so the family can, can get the uh, estate settled, and I think this, what, what we've got here does that. Okay. And I don't, I don't think we create any confusion by, by leaving it like that. I think... The, I think it's the best way. Jack? Okay. I'm just curious. How long has the property been in the family's um, ownership? I think you've had it since the 60s, early 60s. The Halstead family? Mm -hmm. 1949. 1949. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? 
Yeah, this has kind of been a difficult one. We've talked to, I've talked to Harold about it several times, talked to Ms. White about it several times. I've even talked to Bobby about it, Ms. Henley. And she's been scratching her head what to do. She just said, Don, take care of it. So, <laughs> so, so we've, we've come up with this, and I think this is the cleanest, clearest way to, to handle it okay. and, and let the family go ahead and get the estate settled. And then if that situation comes about again, I think. Uh, I'll put the line back. Or Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Horsley? I make a motion that we approve the application as stated. Do you have a second? I'll second it. Right. A motion by Mr. Horsley and a second by Mrs. Oliver. Ready to vote? Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner. Aye. By recorded vote of nine in favor, zero against, agenda item number eight has been recommended for approval. Great. All right. New to item 13. Okay. Agenda item 13 is Serza Enterprises LLC, an application for a conditional use permit motor vehicle sales on property located at 6056 Indian River Road, located in the Centerville District. Will the applicant. Oh, hi, Eddie. Thank you, Ms. Sandalu. Um, for the record, Eddie Berdon, Virginia Beach Attorney, representing um, Serza Enterprises, LLC. Um, this is an application for conditional use permit on a um, parcel about 30, 33, 34,000 square feet um, on the corner of uh, Indian River Road and what's the name of that lane? Depositor Lane. I guess the bank got to name the lane. Um, <clears throat> bank was there for, for many, many years um, and Frankly, the property with this application is going to be utilized to a much lesser degree. Uh, there will only be 12 cars displayed on site, uh, and it will be, um, they'll also have some internet sales from the, from the site, uh, but the traffic generation is far less than the bank, um, and we're using the, the property as well landscaped to begin with. The bank's a beautiful building. We're not changing any of that. It would be one of the nicest looking um, buildings for a a car dealership that I've seen in Virginia Beach or elsewhere. The uh, applicant is putting um, additional landscaping on the property that staff has described in which you heard about this morning in the informal um, session. The um, conditions and they're very typical um, and strong conditions. Uh, no, there's no repair work that's taking place on this property. No outside storage of any tires, materials, debris, et cetera. It'll be maintained as the bank has maintained it. Um, and so really there's not, not a lot of change here other than uh, fewer uh, traffic trips per day. The, um, the hours are, are um, longer hours, however, than the banks, you know, you know bankers, um, they, don't, they don't spend a whole lot of time at the office. So um, the one condition that's problem that was came up at the 11th hour um, is condition number three. And that is, um, and we agree with the um, traffic engineering folks um, that this front access or front um, curb cut on depositor is not a very safe access point. Um, it was used for access by the bank, although primarily it was an exit from the, um, the drive through. But we totally agree it will not be an access to this, that, uh, this uh, use. In fact, we will be using the the area in front of the building as the primary display area where there'll be eight vehicles displayed. And so we will absolutely ensure that it's not used as access. Um, and by doing so, we'll put no you know, entry signs on either side of the existing um, curb cut onto depositor. And we will always have a motor vehicle parked parallel to depositor that blocks that from ever being used for access. Um, and we're perfectly amenable to that. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, there's not an issue with vehicles leaving through there, but we're not going to have vehicles leaving through there either. Now, it is conceivable that we may have to move a car that's on display out through there by pulling the, the car that's blocking it out and bring, take that car out, um, but we can also go the other way. Uh, but access, we agree to totally. But the idea of tearing it out and putting in curb and gutter when we're lessening the use to begin with um, is not acceptable to us, and I don't think it makes any sense um, whatsoever. Um, but we totally agree, not access. But the idea of closing it 
Um, we'll close it, but we'll use a vehicle to do that. Plus, we'll put signs on either side. Um, no, you know, do not enter, no access, but you have to run through the car to do that. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We agree with all the conditions that staff has recommended. Um, other, and, and we agree with the word, we agree with the first part of number three, but closing it, and of course that hasn't been defined, but we certainly don't think it makes any sense to, uh, to come in <laughs> something that's, again, used for a, a lot more years for um, traffic going in and out, but mostly out. Um, and we're not, we're going to make sure it's not used for anybody coming in. We got two other entrances on depositor that will be the entrances that will be used. Be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Is there any more speakers? There's speakers? Okay. Thank you. I'll reserve, come back and respond. Okay. We do have one speaker virtual, Teresa Bracey. Ms. Bracey, if you could wait two to three seconds and then begin your comments. Thank you, Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Commission members. Um, I'm Dr. Teresa Bracey. I own Indian River Veterinary Hospital located at 6070 Indian River Road. Um, today, I'm speaking in opposition of agenda item number 13 for a conditional use permit to operate a motor, motor vehicle sales at 6056 Indian River Road. In support of my concerns, I would like to address two points. In the background and summary of the proposal section of this application, planning staff Dow includes a summary of zoning history, which highlights specific properties consistent with this applicant applications proposed use. However, I feel it expressly excludes business use, which does not support the application. I would like to point out to the, plan the planning board, the following businesses and addresses that were not included. Uh, Rotano dentistry at 6062 in River road. Eastern Virginia Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at 6033 Providence Road, Agape Chiropractic Center, 6070 Indian River Road, Tidewater Dental Group, 6095 Indian River Road, Sleep Specialist of Tidewater at 6025 Providence Road, and Indian River Veterinary Hospital at 6070 Indian River Road. These properties represent professional medical related businesses located within two tenths mile north, south, east, and west of the application address. Based on current zoning alone, these areas are not specifically designated as medical business district. However, the use is consistent with that. I do not feel this application use permit is consistent with the surrounding business operations in close proximity, and I feel the proposed use would have a negative impact on those businesses. As staff planner um, Dow points out, while there are gas service stations and convenience stores in close proximity, to my knowledge, there's no motor vehicle sales lots currently along any river road. As a business owner and long-term resident, I would suggest we keep it that way. The best example we have of a, sim of a similar business, which staff also doesn't mention, is Westview Auto Inc., located at 6216 Indian River Road, which is three-tenths of a mile from this location. On the highly visible corner of Indian River Road and Sunnyside Drive, Westview Auto is an auto service center. At all times, as many as 70 cars in various degrees of dilapidation are um, occupying a 21,000 square foot lot, creating a eyesore for the community and um, affects property values. While the application includes 13 conditions in an attempt to mitigate public concerns, none of the proposed conditions specify that I saw. There was a comment that was um, um, made by um, the attorney, um, but it, I didn't see where it limited the number of cars to be parked on the premises. Um, he, he spoke different of that, so maybe we can address that. Um, citing also, for example, uh, the numerous used car sale lots located along Military Highway and Virginia Beach Boulevard sections of the city, I would point um, Any more speakers? No more speakers. One, one quick question one, for one second. Um, Mr. Tom, do we have anybody from traffic engineering here? Or can you answer a question? Rick Loman is on. Is he? I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious. This bank has been here for a long time, and I'm sure there was many times where people exited the drive through and came out this area, the access to be closed onto Indian River Road. Um, I think, actually, I have done it before. Um, and I didn't see any. I'm just curious what, what the difference is now. Is Rick, if you're there, what the difference is now compared to what it was when it was a bank, when it was going to be less 
vehicular traffic going through there. Break it, break it. Three seconds. Hi, Mr. Wiener. Um, this is Rick Lohman, uh, traffic engineering. Um, I don't, I know that the bank was approved um, well before we had the access standards that we do now. Um, even in using it as a, an, an exit uh, there, it is you know close to Indian River Road. We wouldn't approve an access point. Um, in fact, our public work standards you know don't allow access points within a certain distance of a radius um, to a major road. Um, so we just felt like um, closing this access point would be in the best interest of access management for you know for not only depositor lane but traffic turning into and out of Indian River Road. Okay, I'll hold on one second. I have another question for you, Rick. So, um, Rick, when you define close the entrance, please, is that a permanent close? Um, it, if we're if we're looking at like a a temporary reuse of a site, then then yes, we could consider like a temporary closure, like uh, for instance, using big flower planters. Um, perhaps to close the entrance off. If we're looking at a permanent reuse of a site, then then we would want that uh, you know entrance ripped out and the sidewalk um, kind of extended through there because it does you know it, it would help you know pedestrian access to just get rid of that curb cut totally so you don't have to go down and then back up um, you know across the entrance. So in this case, um, you know, I think we said closed, meaning that we'll never want that access point used again, even if the site is reused for another use. So um, I'll let you guys define how you want to close it. Um, but we have put planters or, you know, something permanent in there so that, you know, vehicles can't exit, enter or exit from there. Any other questions for it? Thank you, Mr. Lerman. Mr. Chair, uh, yes. First of all, uh, the uh, the doctor who the veterinarian who's who spoke uh, there uh, there is a there, she even mentioned something. There's a car dealership uh, just two blocks to the west uh, on Indian River Road. This uh, this is not going to be like those. That's for sure. I mean, and I'm not saying anything bad about about those, but you know, this very clearly on the plan. Um, that there will be 12 vehicles displayed uh, on site. That's, you know, I, I can't, don't know what else I can say other than that's exactly what we have agreed to. The, um, and the conditions, uh, one of the conditions, one of the things she referenced was cars that were dilapidated or whatever. Now, that won't be the case here. And there's a condition that clearly addresses it. These are standard conditions now. They weren't necessarily standard conditions 15, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and I don't know how long these other um, dealerships have been there, but uh, so this site, it is, a, it is probably going to be a temporary use. I don't know that it will last you know, for, um, for 30 or 40 years. I doubt it. Um, but the, it will clearly not change the character of this property a bit, and I don't think it will have any negative impact on anybody's property value, um, not at all. That this, back to, to, to Mr. Lohman's uh, point, we are agreeing that it, that that front current ingress egress for vehicles um, will be closed off and we will close it off and we'll have signs up so it's not used for access or exit it is true that on the original exhibit we showed you know an exit lane but that was really for our own um, vehicles that won't happen we'll take that off the off of the plan there will it will not be used uh, but to go in and put in curb and gutter is not something that um, it really, given that we're, nothing we're doing will make the traffic generation anything other than less than what it was. And if a bank had bought the property and or the bank was still operating, there's nothing anybody could do about it. So uh, we're, we're not in disagreement over not, it not being used to access 
Uh, frankly, if, if, our, if one of our vehicles goes out and, and onto depositor and, and turns in behind there uh, on the second access, it's certainly not a, you know, a dangerous situation, and that road doesn't have a great deal of traffic. Indian River does, and I totally agree with Mr. Lohman with regard to you know, somebody trying to turn in onto depositor and stopping traffic that backs up on in, in Indian River. We, we will make sure that doesn't happen by taking the actions that, we, that I've described if that's what city council ultimately uh, believes or uh, I guess putting up, a, frankly putting those, <laughs> those planters out there I think looks frankly tacky myself. I think having a car blocking the access and signs is, is not, especially on a, when all these other new cars are out there, it'd be a better way to do it. I wanna say something real quick. Don't, don't throw things at me. That's when, that's when I say something. So if we approve it like it is, like you want us to approve it so it could be blocked by just a sign and what you just said about hold on a second what you just said about is only a temporary situation for maybe a year maybe two years five years whatever but they but if it goes back to being a bank building they're not going to have to come in front of us because it seems like me traffic engineering went, just wants this closed off for future reference if it goes back if we can if we approve the condition now the way you want it and it goes back to being a bank in the future then they're not going to. They can't come in front. They can use this as an ingress egress in the future. Well, I, I heard Mr. Lohman say if it was a temporary, if it was temporary use, then he was fine with putting planters out there. That's what I heard him say, and that's what I was addressing. Right, and and I, and I have that. And then if the next person that comes along, it'll be in a condition in their temporary use, right? Temporary for ingress. No, you can't be a. It won't be open all the time for ingress egress, so. So the next person that comes out here to do this, you know, you see what I'm getting at. So we, we kind of want to, kind of want to make it to where you can't, not permanent, but there's something to be. If you need to build a wooden box and put some flowers in it or something, <laughs> to, to close it off. I just, I just said, I think that looks tacky. But if that's what, if that's what the city wants to do, then, then you know, that's, we, we, we will make sure it's not used for access. But without anything being there, it's kind of hard to do that. And I'm not saying you won't. Well, I disagree. Like I, that. I, 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 you, we have car dealerships throughout the city of Virginia Beach that when they're closed on weekends, that's exactly what they do to every one of their yeah. entrances. And people don't get through there. I know. Okay. And if we do that permanently with no, you know, no entry signs on either side of that drive aisle, there won't ever be cars going in and out of there. I understand. But putting a, a planter and, you know, like we don't, I guess we don't have to do signs. We put a planter there, but I mean, I, don't know, I just, I, I, I don't think that the planter is, is, I think it's, it's less attractive than having a new vehicle sitting there. Um, yeah, that's my own personal opinion. But Mr. again, that's up, that's up to how, however Mr. you Graham all. Graham has a question for you. It's more of, I guess, a, I just want a clarification. So if, if you did close off that entrance. Um, there would no longer be circulation around the building, and when you went down that little road, it would be a dead end. Am I am I uh, wrong or am I right? That's that's what would happen if you put curb and uh, gutter out there. Yeah, and and I agree. The planners, I think it's tacky when that's done. Um, as former firemen, would you rather have circulation around a building? Mm -hmm. Including half circulation. I was just, just, well, I, I just, I, I was trying to understand. I, I, you know, I, I was just trying to, to, I, to understand. It's a very, it's a very so. good question because I mean, if you, basically if you put curb and gutter out there, you have to tear all, everything back of it out. Or, I mean, it just, it doesn't, it just to me. It, but you're creating a it, dead end. It makes much more sense to make sure it's not used in a, in a way that's consistent, consistent with the use of the property. True, we may be, kicking the can down the road to, you know, with, if this, in this, I don't know how long this use will be there. I'm not suggesting it's only going to be there a year or two. It could be there for 10 or 15 years, but that's a beautiful building. The building's got a lot of useful life left. You know, I don't, you know, I, I just can't sit here and tell you, I mean, banks aren't, you know, we're not building a lot more banks anymore. I mean, it, it's all digital and what have you. So I don't think there's going to be a bank going out here. I'd be very surprised. Um, but it, if you're trying to trying to do an adaptive reuse of the property as it exists, with as little change other than positive change as we can can make, and and putting. Eddie, a, I just I, 
I get, and I'm just not, I'm not going to, I'm not arguing the point, but Rick was fairly clear about having the street closed with, with curbing. I mean, he stated it, and he said that's what he preferred as a traffic engineer. That's the way he wanted the property. Now, it was up to us how we wanted to handle it, but that's what I clearly heard Rick say. Either way, I mean, I'm just. I think he said if it's a permanent, yeah, if it's a, he would if prefer it's a more that permanent use, he'd prefer closed. that, but as, if, but as a temporary use, which this, I think anyone would probably agree, is probably more of a temporary use, you know, it's up to whatever, so however. Is, so is the applicant only going to do this for a short, when you say the, it's a temporary use, so he's, his intent is only to do this ah, temporarily? Because Oliver, the, the, the automobile industry in this country, well, and where that all is going with electric cars and our current administration and everything else, I have no, and, and I've got, I represent some car dealerships. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, if you know, great. I don't know. I, and I don't think anybody really does. So to suggest that it's quote unquote permanent, I mean, permanent is, in my view, of what, what I consider permanent, somebody's going to come in, buy a piece of property, tear down a building, put a, put a lot of money into redoing the property. And that's not what this is. This is adaptive reuse of the existing property as it is for this use. It do, certainly doesn't, it's not going to work for a, for a vet. It's not going to work for a medical office building. So it's a use of the property. It's, a, it's an attractive property. It's less, less impactful use of the property. I have no idea how long it'll be there. And what's temporary versus what's permanent, I don't have really an answer to that either, other than my view is somebody who's going to come in and invest millions of dollars in putting improvements on a piece of property, that's, they're looking at that longer term. Somebody who's buying a property that's already developed is looking for something that provides cash flow for their investment. So it's less permanent, but but it's the only way I can put it. Jack. So if we leave this, if we leave condition three just the way it is, I mean, it will be up to staff to make that determination. What closed? Is that? Well, I think it'll be up to city council up to, to make or city council. Sure. <laughs> okay. That's my my view anyway. Okay. Yeah, I'm. So we're going to, if we leave it in there this way it is, it doesn't say permanently closed with curb and gutter, right? It, it does not. It does not. Mr. And it, this, was a, this, this came up, frankly, it came up at the, you know, towards the tail end of the review process. And I've had very productive conversations with, um, uh, with WA. Um, I have, have not had a chance to have a conversation with, uh, with Rick and probably will moving forward. Um, just, but I'm going to come up here and say approve it as is without putting it out there. You know, our, my client's feelings, and, and I share my client's feelings with regard to the idea that something that's reducing the traffic volume, you know, a lot um, is all of a sudden you have to expend money to put a curb and gutter in, which means then you got a dead end. You know, like, it's just, it's just a, it's not a, in our view, it's not um, a practical thing to do. Mr. DeHaan would say something. For, Clarity's sake, staff would interpret the condition as it's written now is that it would have to be removed. It would have to be pulled out. So if there is a recommendation for a change in the in the condition, then we would like some clarity from the planning commission for us to make that for a, a recommended change to the condition. So what you're saying is the way it's written now, it's it's permanent, permanently closed. It would have to be permanently closed with curbing gutter. That, that's how staff had written it. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, but we would like to, if the commission has any uh wants to change the condition, of course, that's up to the commission. Well, it, and if I could comment. And sure you can. I, I, cer I certainly can see that that is one way to read what it said. But <laughs> I, if it said the, the current ingress and egress from, you know, depositor lane uh, shall be permanently um, closed with curb and gutter, that would have been a lot clearer. And, but then what, ha what do you do with the rest of what's in front of them? So, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, actually, I, I have a couple more questions. Well, well hey, Mr. Perdon, we have a couple more questions. Don't go anywhere. Come on back. Okay. <laughs> um, so my questions are, um, so how, how long is the, how long have they owned it? I'm sorry. The current, um, I, I believe about a year and a half, maybe a year. Okay, so it's been no. vacant for a year and a half. And this is only. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's been short term. I, right, I, I mean, I, they've owned it. It's been vacant since they've. They pretty much owned it. The um, so the 12, 12 vehicles is that maybe that was mentioned and maybe I missed it. It's not in 
It's not a condition. The display area shows 12 the vehicles. Display eight, eight, in, shows. eight in front. Um, actually, I may have, I may be incorrect. It may be 11. 11. Okay. I apologize. So, I, and that's, I, my math skills, lawyers are not good at math. That's, that's it. That's 11 it. vehicles. That's correct. Or 12 vehicles, whatever. And no, but it's not written anywhere that says just a display area. Is that enforceable? I mean, is that a. So, so if they have, if they start putting vehicles in other areas, more than eleven, more than twelve, then, then they can be cited for not being in compliance with their um, your conditional use permit. The, the okay. Is 12, twelve vehicles. Maybe. And I'm sure that the you know twelve vehicles is is pretty minor. I mean that's not. It's a pretty pretty small, not very intense. Um, I would think. And, and with the internet, with internet sales, what what you also have are, you know, you make you can make deliveries of vehicles to people coming who bought on the internet. Mm -hmm. That's the other aspect of it. But okay. that doesn't involve display of vehicles for sale, you know, on site. It also lessens the, and they've got a good condition. The city has a good condition, but it's hard to enforce everything. The the banners and the streamers and all that stuff, you know, you don't see those on a facility like this. Display area. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to close it and open it up to either a motion or a discussion. Who wants to start? Mr. Edmund. I move we approve the application as written, with the conditions as written. As is? I okay. second it. Okay. I don't Mr. Wall has a question. Um, right. I do have a few things to say before, before we vote. I'm ready to vote, but uh, I just want to say, you know, because there was a letter, and uh, it's not just by the veterinarian. That was, you know, a couple, um, couple doors down, you know, the... One of the um, the adjacent uh, property, I don't know if they're an owner or, or a um, tenant, uh, you know, wrote a, wrote a good letter, and, and I felt that it, would, it should probably be um, addressed, you know, also that, you know, it seems like this is a very low intense, intense use, um, and it's, you know, appears it could be temporary, um, but uh, I think it was one of the uh, dental offices that uh, was adjacent that, that had... Um, you know, some, some concern, but I, I think that it, you know, it's mitigated just by the limit of number of vehicles, I mean, in the, the conditions. So, so I'm in favor of it. All right. That's it. We have Thanks. a motion for approval by Mr. Inman and a second by Mrs. Oliver. Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By recorded vote of nine in favor, zero against, agenda item number 13 has been recommended for approval. Right, thank you. Item 15. Okay. Agenda item 15 is Derek and Nicole Howell, an application for a conditional use permit outdoor recreation facility <laughs> on property located at 5409 Blackwater Road in the Princess Anne yeah, District. Mr. Berdon, welcome back. Hold on a second, your mic's Grab not them. catching. Yeah. Yeah. Try it again. Oh. Hello? There we, there we go. Okay. Now we're good. I'm sorry. Eddie Berdon, for the record, representing um, Derek and Nicole Howell on this application for a conditional use permit in the uh, agricultural zoning district for an outdoor recreational um, use. Uh, it's dirty. <laughs> The, um, first of all, uh, Nicole and Derek are here along with um, a number of their um, <laughs> parents whose um, young men uh, play uh, baseball uh, on their field of dreams in Blackwater. Uh, and so they're, they're all here, the ones that take taken off from work and I guess um, <clears throat> may have skipped school, or I guess, what, do we have school now? <laughs> I guess, oh, it's virtual school maybe. <clears throat> so. Um, I, I previously provided this morning some reading material for um, all of you, um, including an article um, on the Blackwater Field of Dreams that was published in the Princess Anne Independent News. Um, it'll be exactly five years ago uh, tomorrow, and as a front page story, I just printed out the, the story itself. Um, <clears throat> the also uh, nine exceptionally well-written letters of support from um, neighbors of uh, Derek and Nicole and, mem and uh, 
parents of uh, young men who've played uh, or are playing uh, on one of the two teams that use this field for practice. Um, and I've also provided you a petition, most with comments, from 2,285 supporters of this application. And this, a substantial, if not, well, clearly the majority of those people are residents of the southern part of the city of Virginia Beach and the southern part of the city of Chesapeake. Um, this, this application has overwhelming support from neighbors in Blackwater uh, and also Pungo and Creeds on the other side of the river. Um, the field built uh, in 2014 um, has been a learning ground for young, young boys 9, 10, 11, and 12 years old, U10, U12 travel baseball players. Um, once they're <coughs> 13, once they play on the U14 level, they're 13 and 14 year old um, young men, they have to have a bigger field. This is not a regulation field. Um, it, you adjust the base paths um, for the difference between U10 and U12. There are only two teams that use this field and they're coached by um, uh, Derek Howell and um, one of the other uh, parents. And <coughs> That field, the field is used on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays for practice. Uh, it's not generally used on Friday. Wall was nice enough to put Friday in there because if there are rain outs of practice, they will occasionally practice on Friday, but generally speaking, they don't have practice on Friday. Um, <clears throat> games are held on the weekend. Uh, they travel, they're not all here. In fact, I think after, is it the last weekend or this coming weekend, there won't be any more games probably until uh, the fall, that, that unless there are rain out, at the, if they get a lot of rain up in Williamsburg or Yorktown or somewhere, then they, and they don't get it down here, they may, um, they may play, they may switch it and play here. But basically, 16 weekends out of the year, um, there'll be uh, a game, or, and and game means these are six inning games. So, <laughs> the condition really, I think, should be clarified um, that there's they have a double header, the same two teams play two six inning games on the same day back to back. So 12 innings max if you don't have the five run rule, the 10 run rule, or the 15 run rule, which shortens the game to three, four, or six innings, five innings, excuse me. So um, it's not, you're talking about the games don't start until 10 o'clock in the morning, um, <clears throat> no earlier than that, and they're usually gonna be over two o'clock, three o'clock in that range. So <clears throat> um, that one condition, it's, it's technically two six-inning games, but it's not different teams, it's the same two teams, so there's no people coming and going. Um, there are 36 weekends in the spring, the summer, and the fall. That's 16 out of 36. There are 48 or plus or minus on a year, so it's, it's not, not all year round by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and the, the practices, there's some, the, the opponent, as, which we're agreeing the condition, to say that, we're agreeing the condition, no lights. But the only time there are ever lights are temporary lights that Derek brings out, that he's got for his business. And in the last week in October, daylight savings time changes. They stopped playing baseball 10th, 10th, somewhere 10, 15 days into November. So you got about three weeks when they would use temporary lights that are facing in to the field, not somebody else's property, for those three weeks just for practice for an hour and a half once it gets dark. We agree to the condition there won't be any more lights. But that's the only time there are ever lights. Nobody's playing out there at night. <laughs> so um, I, I can't say more eloquently, I've been doing this a long time, I cannot speak more eloquently than the people who wrote these letters. And I hope that some of you had a chance, I'm not gonna sit here and read them to you, to read these letters. They're very moving, they're very well, well, well written. <clears throat> and um, on the other issues on the conditions, um, I addressed the Friday, it's not really a practice day, but if there's a rain out, we don't want anybody saying, hey, they were out there practicing on Fridays because they got rained out, you know, a couple of practices during the week. Number two, the same day, double header of the same teams. It's, it's 12 innings is basically one game it can, if it goes extra innings, but you know, that's, <clears throat> it's actually two six inning games, same teams. Number seven, that condition, um, uh, there are, this, these, the Howells and their wonderful, wonderful parents and all these testaments, testamentaries will tell you that, um, they 
have sponsors to help defray the cost of the team because they do travel to play and they take them on a trip this year. They're taking all the kids to, um, to Canton, to the Hall of Fame. Um, did I say that right? It's not Canton. I'm sorry. It's, it's not Canton. That's football. It's um, Cooperstown. Cooperstown. Sorry. Thank you, Bob. It's Cooperstown. Jeez, loosen my sports. Um, so, and, and these are sponsors, local businesses that help sponsor the team. And these boys grow up and they wind up playing for Kellum High School and, or they, maybe Hickory or somewhere in, in southern Chesapeake. Um, but they can't be, these banners are not visible from anywhere. You can't see them from any street unless you're you know, up in a drone and you can't see them from the neighbor's house either. Um, they're on the, on the outfield fence and they, they face uh, to the north. They don't face to the south. Um, and they're not signage. They're not out on any street. So, and I don't, I'm pretty confident that the, our ordinance doesn't prohibit those. All access comes off of uh, Blackwater Loop. It does not come off of the shared driveway on Blackwater Road. The, the parents all know and have for years, they do not access from uh, Blackwater Road over the shared driveway. The vehicles always park and always have parked on the house property, not in the public right of way, not on anybody else's property, not blocking anybody other than the Howells. Um, <clears throat> so condition number eight, the 30 vehicles, generally speaking, that's a, that's a fair number. Uh, but after, as far as what's been experienced over the six years that this has been used um, as a baseball field, um, but with COVID, there's been a, a, a lot more people parents, um, excuse me, not just parents, but grandparents, uncles, aunts that are coming to the games to see their, their, their niece, nephew, grandchild, whatever. Um, but it's almost entirely family, and the team is like family. So there have been more cars, and there's plenty of room for the cars. We just don't want to get anything. Somebody said, oh, well, they, we counted 35 cars out there. You're violating your use permit. As long as we're not bothering anybody else with, with the parking of the vehicles, we're not in the public right of way, Blackwater Road is not, other than if you have a broken down tractor or somebody ran into a ditch, generally not a major, major backup for vehicles getting in and, in and out of uh, Blackwater. Um, <clears throat> so we, we don't think the banner thing makes any sense. We're not going to put up any signs. There are no signs. Um, we think the 30 vehicles is um, potentially problematic. Um, but all of the other conditions are... Um, and we appreciate staff's work on this. They're all absolutely acceptable to Mr. and Ms. Howell. Um, there is also the likelihood that um, as <coughs> their ch children growing older, there may only be one team uh, there. This has never been used as a field for a league, as the opponent um, has indicated. That's just complete balderdash. This last thing I'll say, there are two very, very nice lighted baseball diamonds on Head of River Road, probably less than a mile from here. And Mr. Howell and, and his other coach attempted a number of years ago to um, offer to take care of those fields, pay rent for those fields, or for a field. They're not trying to, you know, trying to, you know, basically hoard the fields, but take care of a field, pay rent to the city for a field. The fields are not well used to say the least. And we're told you can't because you're not a little league team, you're a travel team. So we've got two well lit, very nice fields, very close to here that they can't use, cannot use, that are not like in the middle of Little Neck or Great Neck where people are clamoring you know, to get on the fields. Uh, so he took, said, look, <laughs> you know, we want to be a family, you know, we'll, We'll spend the time, the money, the energy, the effort to put together what he's done here, which has been a, you know, it's fantastic. And you look at all those letters of support for people all on Blackwater Loop, all around there. Um, you know, it, it's it's they're good, they're good folks, and they're doing a good thing. Something our our um, society needs at this point, and it's al always needs, but right now it definitely needs. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Mr. Bedon? Well, Mr. Bedon. Mr. Bedon, uh, just want to go back to the conditions uh, the yes. banners um, are those like the standard baseball banners they put on the outfield just for just I mean these these guys are going to be doing for some fundraising to help pay for whatever and they need those sponsors is that what you're talking is that that's that's exactly what I'm talking about there's sponsors banners that are hanging on the center field inside fence. of the field. inside the fence three yes, foot sir. tall yes sir exactly they're not visible 
I mean, you can't. The only place you see them is if, if you're if you're standing there watching a game. Because unlike the letter, there are no bleachers. There have never been any bleachers, as the gentleman alleges in his letter. But nothing on like the dugouts or in the There's back. No, there somewhere. are no dugouts. Okay, we're good for that. <laughs> but nothing on the street or anything like that. Not, so I didn't know where the. There's nothing hanging on the backstop. Okay. There's nothing. It's just on the center field fence. There are banners that are hanging there. Yeah, off yeah, of you the, can see it. Yeah, you can see it on the picture that staff's got there. For the partners that help. Exactly, the sponsors of the, of the okay. boys' team. That's exactly right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Bedon. I'm Thank sure you, we'll Mr. talk to Chairman, you soon. Chairman, appreciate it. Madam Clerk. Mr. Chair, we have two speakers. Okay. Mike Waterman and then Buddy Altman. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, for the opportunity to speak today in favor of uh, approval of the uh, conditional use permit. State your name for the record, please. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Mike Waterman. Thank you. Sir, I'm, I'm also representing my wife, Dr. Jennifer Waterman, who wrote one of the letters of support, as well as the about approximately 20 families who uh, use the field on a regular basis. Um, I have two sons, ages 10 and 12, uh, who both have played at this location for about two years. We consider ourselves to be an e extremely fortunate to have found a family, a team, and a location who provides such a positive um, and constructive environment for our kids to play the, the game they love. The Howells have provided a, a tremendous location where kids are taught lessons of teamwork, success, failure, uh, discipline, and the benefits of physical activity. All, all of these things, all of these opportunities are, are less and less now with the COVID restricted environment. So additionally, as a dentist, my wife is a, a dentist who submitted one of those letters. Uh, she has several dozen patients who have uh, either play there now or has families that go there to watch games. And without exception, they just rave about the experience they have there and, and it's one to never be forgotten. It's really become an, an institution in uh, local youth baseball circles. It truly is a, a, a field of dreams. Um, this seems to really just be an argument of one person's personal complaints. Um, frankly, seem, seem petty and others factually incorrect. Um, and I just have trouble seeing how the issues of, of the crack of a bat, the occasional cheering and laughing of kids, um, some uh, additional traffic every once in a while, how that outweighs the benefits of this resource that provides something so innocent and pure as kids playing baseball. Um, while I understand some of these are inconveniences maybe for, for the, a neighbor, the overall benefits to the community and their children far outweigh these inconveniences. I would think that common sense dictates that there are logical compromises here that would maintain this valuable, invaluable facility for the community. Uh, the Howells themselves have sacrificed a tremendous amount of time, effort, and their own money to establish this field for, for, the, for all of our families and, and, as, and for the community. They're clearly not in it for any financial profit whatsoever. Their interest is only to provide a safe and convenient place for our kids to play baseball. I strongly urge you to approve this request for a use permit and to allow for this positive out outlet to continue for the community. So I thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Buddy Altman. Welcome, sir. Welcome, and thank you for letting me put my uh, intake on this. First off, my name is Stuart Altman. Buddy is a nickname. My real name is Stuart. Um, I live at 5433 Blackwater Road, which is the only adjoining neighbor to 5409. Every other neighbor <clears throat> is separated by a road, either Blackwater Loop or Blackwater Road. Um, I have some, ob not objections, but I have some differences of opinion for what some of the statements that were made earlier by the former gentleman. Um, when I moved into the house in 2008, there was an empty lot on either side of our house. The, the property backs up the trees. I loved it. The, I had plenty of privacy. Uh, the, the, it was peace, tranquility. Um, there was minimal traffic on Blackwater Road. I loved the house. I loved the, the fact that I could go out in the backyard. It was peace and quiet. You could hear the birds sing. 
and then that lasted for several years. Later on, as time, you know, as things would have it, um, a house was built on 5409, and we were not the previous owners, neither us nor the house were the previous owners, the original owners of this property. Apparently, the previous owners had some kind of joint effort where they wanted a horseshoe driveway on 5409. I called the city about this, and the city said apparently there is some kind of uh, city provision that says driveways on Blackwater Road cannot be more than X a feet together because it disrupts the traffic flow on Blackwater Road. Um, but the positioning of his septic and my septic has to be where the driveway was adjoined. That's how the thing started. Uh, on several occasions, I asked him not to build the adjoining driveway. I asked him to please cut down on the traffic uh, because of the cars coming up and down the driveway, and that was met with rejection. Um, they said that the driveway is no longer, is not used for two-way traffic for the baseball field. That is physically incorrect. From 2014 until maybe two months ago, the driveway was used, the shared driveway was used for multiple cars. There was multiple times where myself, my wife could not even get up and down our own driveway from all the cars going up and down the driveway. Now, apparently the city said that the shared driveway was provisioned to, to um, keep away from disruption of traffic. If you have two families, each family might have an, uh, you know, say four cars a piece. That's eight cars that could possibly leave at one time and that's at two different places. Now, imagine 40 or 50 cars all leaving at the same time. That would be a lot more traffic disruption than just two houses with two driveways. Um, now, as you all well know, generally the progression of a conditional use permit is you approach the city, you give them plans and, you know, of what you plan on doing. This ball field has been in operation since 2014 with no permit. Sir, thank you for your comments. Appreciate that. Any That's questions? All. Questions, thank you. I have one more comment to make. Um, if this permit goes through, I cannot take it anymore. My family will be forced to move. What about the resale of my house? Who's gonna buy a $700,000 house that backs up to a community baseball field with an adjoining driveway? Thank you, sir. Mr. Bradon. Um, I'll offer an answer. A, a buyer who recognizes the value of a piece of property as being worth $700,000 and one who, like majority of people in this room in this country, love kids and love baseball. That's who but that depends on whether the house is actually worth $700,000. I think it's gone up 50,000 in the last few weeks based on the letter I read. Um, <clears throat> the shared driveway is a, an easement that was created when the properties were subdivided uh, and it is equally on both properties. The only folks who are, ever have used that driveway other than my clients, the Howells, are possibly some people who have come from out of town to games with their children and don't know. That could have happened occasionally. My client has a, he's invested, he's gonna, he's blocked it off. It doesn't happen. It won't happen under these conditions. Um, the, the concerns of Mr. Altman, um, I don't believe were expressed until just the most recent um, past. Now, I don't know the exact time, but it, Again, it's been there since 2014, the fall of 2014. It, it's been well publicized and, and, you know, but it's not for the whole general public, it's just a very finite use. But um, uh, the, the condition says it won't be used and it won't be used, plain and simple. And I'm not gonna get into an argument over how, how trapped he believes he was in his driveway and unable to get out. I, I just, I find that a little, uh, difficult to uh, to uh, believe, but <clears throat> and then it, reading the letter, um, constant traffic coming up and down the driveway, which causes family to be blocked, is in my view, and in the view of all the folks here, um, fabrication. Um, <clears throat> it's not. And he also talked about the ball field and the bleachers, 
there are no bleachers, have never been any bleachers. He complains about the chain length fencing. He's got chain length fence in his backyard, his backyard's chain length fence. Kind of, kind of hard, to, hard, to, hard to put those two together. Um, this is a great thing that they're doing. It's a great application, and it's conditioned to make certain that Mr. Altman's um, enjoyment of his property um, isn't diminished, at least not to the point that someone who had a house worth 650000 last last month um, wouldn't be willing to pay it if it was worth it. Be happy to answer any questions. I hope you all will consider um, <clears throat> revising the conditions, as I've indicated, with regard to these banners, uh, with regard to the number of cars. Again, they all will go out on the two two accesses this property has from Blackwater Loop, not through Mr. Altman's driveway. And there's a barricade that's been uh, up and will continue to be up um, that will not permit that to happen uh, when people are coming or going. Uh, be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Mr. Bedon? Uh, Mr. Bedon, Mr. Graham, has a question? The barricade, is that something that, is that a condition? Um, there's, a, there's a condition that, that it not be used, and, and the Howells have purchased a, a barricade. Any of you have been out there to see the, um, the field will have you know, not probably noticed it, that they put it temporary. Put, you put it up you know, on the weekend. When they have a game that right. day. Right, exactly. Okay, got it. And it, it's where the, where the driveway forks. Obviously, we're not cutting off access to Mr. Altman using the driveway to get to his property. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Oh, Jack? It's just a quick one about number one. Um, and, you know, obviously you're fine with the, the hours, but it's, uh, and maybe this is more for staff, it's, it's not that they can't use it. It can't be used for official, official practices because I'd, I'd hate to limit and somebody to, couldn't use it before 5 p.m. in the, the middle of the, the summer. Um, I mean, some of these are kind of um, vague, but. but you, you raise a very good point, Mr. Wall. Um, like, what's the use, official, official it's, practice use? It, it's the actual use of the field itself. Actual use, you can't even go out there to throw a baseball then. Right. It's, we're trying to limit the, the hours. Uh, I understand the concern about it being in the summertime, but we can. My understanding was the organized games, organized, and organized practices, were that were being limited. Not my, my, like said, right, my, not not the use of. They've got a daughter who plays softball. They've got three three sons. I mean, they go out there. And they can. It's on their property. They can go out and use it. And if they had a couple of friends over. They can certainly use it. It's about organized. It's their. It's, the, it's not the public. Yeah, that's a good catch, Jack, uh, Mr. Wall. I, I, I had no idea that would be what staff believed that it's going to sit there vacant, uh, er, that the, the Howells can't even use their own property. Well, well we can discuss. I mean, we can discuss. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, Ms. Klein? Uh, Bobby, this question is for you. What do we know about the limitations placed on the neighborhood fields that this league cannot use? I am not aware of those limitations that are from Parks and Recreation, Mr. I can answer that. Okay, great. Um, I was, was the director of girls softball for Kempsville Rec Association for 10 years, and they had people that tried to come in and use our field, and Parks and Recs will not let you do that because it's owned by the city, so Parks and Recs will not let you do that. It's an insurance thing. You're not signed up to play for the city, so if you're not signed to play for the city, then you can't use their field. Another team can't use their field. Now they'll rent it to somebody, the Little League team or something, but I, don't, I can't get into the weeds and all that. But, okay. but I know they, the city Parks and Recs won't let you do it unless it's a city-organized um, uh, team. Okay. I'll keep going then. Um, <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> so I... Um, I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to say that I don't like baseball or support children. Um, I have, I have one. Um, but as someone who eventually wants to leave the re the dense re residential area and move out to a more rural area, I can empathize with Mr. Altman having this nice serene area um, that Don so fiercely protects, and 
now all of a sudden every weekend and a couple times a week during the year, he has kids and families just descending upon the property. Um, so I, I hear those concerns what, who, anyway. Um, so I have concerns supporting the application without being able to come to some sort of compromise between the homeowners because what the neighboring property is directly impacted by what happens on that property, home value aside. Like, he's the, he, you don't move out into the middle of the country to have the noise that you would get in the, in the neighborhoods. Um, and at the same time, I understand how the Howells want to be able to use their property that they purchased it. Like, that's, it's their property to use. And so I'm very conflicted about moving forward on this. Um, because I can, I appreciate where both sides are coming from, and I, I feel deeply for Mr. Altman. Who's, who's next? Who's next? Anybody? Ms. Torsley, want to go? Yeah. Um, as, as a father that's had two sons that grew up playing baseball, there's nothing that I would rather do than watch my boys play baseball when, I was, when they were growing up. I mean, I'd rather do that than do anything myself. I mean, that, that's that's a pleasurable thing, and it's. I mean, it may, doesn't fit everybody, but you know, there there are people that like that, and they. My two boys had grandparents who loved to do the same thing, and if they were playing ball, they were there. I tell you, no matter where it was and whatever. So, so uh, I can understand the way these these parents feel, and. Uh, Oddly enough, and this is a little piece of history for folks, there used to be a baseball field right across the road on Blackwater Loop from this field. Um, it was back in the, I remember it when I came here in the 70s and it, you know, it, it was pre, pre uh, it was a whole, here a whole lot before I came here. And it was for the neighborhood kids to play ball, you know, they didn't have another place to play and they would play. And, and some of them up there around the loop still remember that because I think they've asked the house, is this going to replace the field that used to be here back when my daddy used to play here, you know? So, so that, that's what it was. So, I mean, what they've done is a good thing. I'm sorry about the, the, the deal with the parks and rec, but, I mean, that's just the way it is. And uh, you feel grateful that you've had some a parent, uh, two parents that were – were willing to stick the neck out and proceed with this. They could have said, well, we just won't be able to do it, you know, but they, they found a way to get it done. And I, um, I appreciate that. And I'm very familiar with this property. I used to, I farmed all this property before either one of the homes were built there and, uh, and dealt with the uh, landowners and, and assisted them in getting, getting their properties subdivided and all when that happened because they, they needed to get that done. And, um, you know, I hated to see any houses built there, but, I mean, I understand, and they were large lots and whatever, so, so it was fine, and, and the way it's developed, it's been fine. I, I, even after these houses were built, right by the, the gentleman, Mr. Altman, I think his name is, I farmed that little piece of land there, six acres, because it's the only piece that people had left, and I'd go in there and farm it until, two year, until last year, I think, it was the first year that, that, that piece was sold. And somebody else was, is farming it now, but so so I'm very familiar with it, and familiar with the, the neighbors and the, the the people in the area are saying, "What's going on with the ball field? Who would who would object to it? kids playing ball?" I said, "Well, so evidently somebody got rubbed raw a little bit at one time, but I thoroughly support the application. I mean, um, I would like to eliminate the the condition about the banners number seven. I'd like to eliminate that entirely." And I either want to up that number of vehicles or eliminate the number eight where it says 30 vehicles because you put a number of, number in there, like Mr. Berdon said, somebody's going to be, the first thing you're going to do is that somebody's going to be counting and the, the house have five vehicles of their own that park there. So that doesn't leave much room for error. So, so I would either want to expen, extend, extend that number uh, you know, considerably higher or either eliminated because all the parking is on their property. That's that, that driveway they were used that they were talking about using. Uh, that I was told that that will not be used. I saw the barrier that he's gotten and he's he stands it up and 
uh, in the driveway so that it can't, can't be used. And, um, but that was the way the property was subdivided in the beginning, that those two driveways would be together. And so, um, so they're the two uh, issues that I have. The, so far as the 15-foot net, uh, I asked Mr. Howell, I went, and I went to the property Saturday and walked the property, and I asked Mr. Howell, I said, how far is it from, from home plate out to, to where the tree line is or, or to your property line? And I think he says 280 or 300 feet. I said, a 12-year-old, if he can hit it out there, man, I would love to pat him on the back and shake his hand because that's, a, he's, that's pretty good. But I think that that issue is taken care of what some balls did get over on the, on the other property. Uh, that um, some of the older kids at that time, but he says they've taken care of the older kids. Don't that he doesn't let them do that that type of batting practice anymore. But I, I'll attest too that you know I farm a lot of property and golfers hit golf balls in my fields all the time. And you know, but I don't get upset about it. You know, it's he will, they want to walk out and get them. They do. Most of them don't. They leave them out there. I pick them up and give them to the kids to play with. But. Um, uh, baseballs are more valuable than a golf ball, so so uh, if know. somebody wanted to, <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not a golfer, so maybe I got some golf balls I can give you. So. But anyway, I just just I'd like to offer those those comments. I I, uh, I really appreciate what was taking place here, and and Mr. House, I think his youngster, youngest son is, I think he told me he was ten, he got two or three more years left, and I said, what are you going to do then? He said, we really don't know, you know, I don't know whether I'm gonna, can any co coaching or not or whatever, but but uh, I do do think that, uh, that that this is a good good project and and it's got the support of of most all of the people down there. You know, it's not but one or two that, that don't support it. So yeah. so um, th they're, they're my questions about the netting and and uh, I, I got a question mark about that because but he has consented that he would put it up, but I says a. Uh, T telephone poles with a net strung across of it aren't very pretty as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you're going to look at be looking at it in the middle of a field. But, but if, it, if, that's what, if that be the case, he has to do it, I think he will. He, he said he would do it. But, but the other two things, I would, would like to, you know, change those conditions. Okay. Sounds good. Jack? Can we, um, sir, you know, Put your mic, mic, microphone. Okay. So if this, if this does move forward, um, can we... Can we discuss a little bit about those those conditions and possibly what's the foundation for um, so it's you know looking at at the num number you know maybe bouncing around but number eight you know it seems kind of arbitrary and and hard to hard to enforce you know it's only sixteen maximum sixteen times um, which you know it could be a lot but what is what was the foundation you know the background for that. That condition. Do you mean condition number eight, Mr. Wall? Number eight, right? Thirty vehicles. Okay. Mm -hmm. On site, any one time. Well, Paul will come up and. That condition came up from my conversation with the applicant representative. I asked him how many, uh, approximately how many vehicles is going to be on site at a given uh, game or practice, and he told me it's going to be around twenty-five to thirty and I condition it to be the max number, which is 30. And uh, I believe he's indicating that that number may be higher now, so he's requesting that to be higher. Okay. So there's no rhyme or reason why it was 30, basically? What you're getting at is just the applicant. The applicant, the applicant wanted it's, 30. It's an effort to try to reduce the, um, f the traffic flow out there as well to keep right. down the uh, noise okay. mitigation. I'm just, just curious. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll, just, I'll keep going on that one then. Um, so that that actually came from the applicant initially, and you know, just looking at it, they they feel maybe that might be too low. Mm -hmm. um, do we Don? What are your what are your thoughts? Uh, that's way too low. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna put a number, you need to put you need to put fifty. Okay. If you want to put a number, if you, if you, I would rather just eliminate it because all the parking is done on his property. It's and all the access is off of Blackwater Loop Road. Uh, none of it off Black, you know, it doesn't, no did people come on, come to property off the of Blackwater Road. So uh, I, I don't, you know, I, I would think that we, if you, if you're going to put a number, I would, I would suggest 50. 
So you feel it's covered by number nine, which parking for this use shall be limited to the subject property driveway, not within the public right of way. Right. So all the parking's got that. That means all the parking's got to be on his property. It can't be on the street or anything. And he's got he's got room for all that parking. You good, yeah. Whitney. I, I agree with Mr. Horsley. Um, I mean, it, my my son played travel baseball also, and and um, I think it's great that there's this field down there. Um, talking about the net, um, Cooperstown, which is 12U, um, the fence is 200 feet, and Pony Baseball they recommend 175 to mm -hmm. to uh, as far out as 275 for a fence. Um, so I think you know right now it's 300 feet. He, he, he just estimated 280 to 300. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably that's to fine his property rather line. than... That was to his property line. Yeah, I'd probably... I don't know that the, that the net's necessarily uh, important. Um, I agree, um, you know, either, either limit it to 50 or just strike it. Um, I think the banners are fine. Um, the hours, uh, not, not being able to... Um, practice or play before five o'clock doesn't really make sense to me, especially during, you know, it gets, it gets dark at five o'clock and uh, after, um, you know, later in October. So, I, I mean, to me, that needs to be modified. Um, and then as a condition, um, you know, I think the barrier uh, that, that uh, Mr. Howe bought that, you know, maybe that should be in there that there'd be a, um, that the, he would put the barrier up before, uh, games or 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 uh, even practices. I mean, that just seems fair. That protects the homeowner next door. But um, but I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna support this. I think it's I think it's great that these people are doing this. Um, I think it's important for these kids to have a place to play baseball. I understand. I've actually gone and tried to get baseball fields and practice fields, and it is so hard. And it's easy for somebody to say, "Oh, there's a field down there." It's it's not. It's not like that. I think it's great that they've done this, and I'm going to support this. So, so far as that barrier goes, number 10 really uh, takes care of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to keep going. So number one, so that, that limits all use of that field. Um, can, we, can we modify that condition? Yeah. Put that to... I mean, nine to dusk would be, <laughs> you wouldn't expect that they would be out there during the weekdays, you know, except, except during the summer. So it's. Jack, I think, I think the reason that was put in there nine to dusk, I think when they organized practices in there, uh, Mr. Bedon, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the organized practices, that's probably when they occur. I what I would assume parents are home from work and they can bring the kids out there. But, uh, you know, the, that's probably for organized practices is what uh -huh. I'm thinking. Can we put, but do we I have think to clarify, we can move do we need that. to clarify that? If, if that's, we, it, could we make it 3.30 or 4? I, I, I'd like to ask Mr. Bedon. Or just eliminate it. Yeah, eliminate it. The times are times that, that the Howells gave me and I gave to Wa mm -hmm. when the teams practice, because that's the only time that we're talking about an influx of vehicles, um, parents, because you know some will drop off and come back, but most will stay. So that's the only time when there's anything other than your normal activity that you'd have around a house with, you know, with four kids, you know, would be, you know, but the, when when they're kids are there, their friends are there, but it's not an organized practice with parents and what have you. I, I can't, I never envisioned that the idea of this condition was to, to restrict the Howells and their guests, not organized baseball, using their own property. I mm -hmm. never envisioned that that was the case, and that's, that's why I didn't have any problem with the condition, because okay. it was just for when there's something organized going on, whether it's games or practices. Okay. So I, if, is, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a good condition as long as it's understood the way it was right. intended that it deals with anything that's organized where, you know, you, the, they're not in, invitees, people that the house invite over, their kids invite over, that they're friends, you know, uh, but I do, I mean, I do think that for Mr. Altman's benefit that the house have no problem with, you know, they won't have 
um, older kids playing home run derby and hitting balls, you know, uh, you know, out of the out of the property. That and and that I think had been at, at one point may have been a point of uh, of contention whether, you know, well, again whether if 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 he wants the 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 barrier up there, the, my client said they'll put it up. I, I don't know if I live there that, that I would want that. I mean, they've planted mm -hmm. all these trees that are growing as it is, but that's something that maybe we can have conversation about with uh, Mr. Altman. But, um, but the other, uh, okay. that's the only time that they have organized, mm -hmm. and that's why that condition was there. Okay, understood, thank you. The, um, the number two, two games, so that, that one is, is meant to un be understood as two six inning Six inning games is what that's understood to be. Okay. Um, the banners, I, we had a, I think, suggestion just to eliminate the condition for the banners. Would that be? Yep. Thank eliminate you. number seven. Eliminate number seven. Okay. Excuse me. Mr. Costin. I'd like to back up a minute. If, if the one game is interpreted as two games that are six innings apiece, we need to say that. I mean, we're not be the ones, we may not be the ones enforcing mm -hmm. this condition down the road someplace. Okay. You might want to add in it that it be games involved the same two teams, because that's really the, that's the impact if you had different teams coming and going. So it's, it's, it's two six inning games, which is what these younger boys play with the same two teams playing in those games. So it's a double header with the same two teams. I think that's that's an important aspect of that condition. That it not be two teams play one game and then another another team comes in to play, you know, or another two teams come to play. It's the same team. So you only have one set of parents for the whole day. And pay. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? George. Um, Mr. Bradon, just at the at the number one um, condition. Um, I'm just going to ask if this is suitable for everyone. Uh, any organized use of the baseball field? Sure. Guys? And that, and that would include, I mean, in, any use that's just not the, the house. Any organized. Correct. So that way families, they're throwing a ball, they're not going to be yeah. Yeah. kicked off. Okay. That, Thank you. And I, while I'm up here, you can certainly add that barrier to the condition that says the driveway mm -hmm. um, won't be used, the shared driveway, that, that um, the house will make sure that barrier is up at the end of their driveway where it turns into a shared driveway as a part of that condition. It's not a, it's not a problem. It just makes it clear that they'll go to that extent to make sure it's not used. <clears throat> Any other comments? <laughs> Jack. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say that, you know, I hope – you know, this, you know, in any way doesn't really affect Mr. Altman's property, and I, I really do feel for him because I, I, you, you would hope that you, you have good relationships with your neighbor, and it's great to have that good relationship, you know, the bonding, um, you know, chatting with them on a, on a positive note every day um, is, 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 a good, is a good thing. And so it's, you know, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, that it is, it's not, you know, in that place. But, we, you know, I hope that it does come to that. I, mean, I hope that it, you know, is... Um, you know that these conditions, and you know maybe the conditional use permit itself is you know helps to um, helps restore that in in some way. Um, but um, you know I I think that it's it's a good application, and I and I'm going to support it, of course. Any other comments? I want to make one comment before we make a motion. Um, I, I I do feel sorry for the neighbor a little little bit, but I mean I I feel a little bit more sorry if. This was 2015. <laughs> the field's been there since 2014. And this is 2021. I mean, it's, I just don't, I, 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 I don't know. It should have happened a long time ago, my hey, personal opinion. I've, I have a response to that because I've been considering that, that very issue and intended to ask it. We don't know what steps the neighbors took to communicate. We have so many people come up here saying that they were operating a conditional use permit and they didn't know, or without a conditional use permit, um, and they didn't know that they were supposed to have one. Um, so I, my hope is that they've been trying to work it out themselves and then it came to a point when Mr. Altman had to pursue any other action. Mm -hmm. um, because I agree, it's been six or seven years 
mm -hmm. you would think this would have been addressed sooner. And so that is not to speak on behalf I'm, of I understand. Them, but so I'm, I'm going to be supporting it. But um, okay. do we need a motion? Uh, well, I'm, I'm ready to win over you. Are. Okay. You okay, I make a motion that the application be approved with the following changes. Uh, number two would be limited to two six-inning games with same teams per day. Um, number four with a net optional with the agreement of the neighbors, if that's possible, an optional net. Um, number seven, eliminated completely. Um, I guess for, for sake of having some type of vehicle count, I guess we should put a number. I would, my preference is to eliminate eight completely and let number 10 take care of it uh, with, with the parking and all on their premises. If y'all prefer... <clears throat> If y'all prefer a number, let me know. But that's my, my preference is to eliminate the 30 vehicle number Excuse eight me. completely. And uh, and then and because parking number nine says parking is limited to to the subject property driveway and not within public right of way, so it's all got to be on his property. So okay. Um, and number ten, uh, I would just put uh, shared prohibited from the shared driveway from Blackwater Road by a barrier. And uh, that would cover him and make sure he's, and the other ones I'd leave alone. All right, Mr. Inman, do you wanna? Turn your mic on, please, please. Mr. Inman, there you go. I was just gonna suggest to Don, on number four, it, couldn't we just add if requested? But um, yeah, 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 ever how you wanna word that. I wanna be, a, you know, I don't wanna be mandatory that he's gotta do it. I, yeah. If requested by the neighboring property, right? right. If the neighbor, if the, if the neighbor wants that, we, we can't, we can't do that. We'll, we it either needs to be a may, be installed, or you could put may be installed. Um, okay. We can't leave the decision or the condition in a way that leaves it between the negotiation between the neighbors. So uh, when it, it's not a negotiation. It's just if the hmm. neighbor requests it. If the neighbor requests it, you got to put it up. Well, let's just put, instead of shall, we put may, may be. Well, then that leaves it up to the uh, property owner to say no. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Horsley, can you, um, or can I amend it with the number one, that it's organized use? Yeah. Okay, just yeah, want to make sure. It's we should there. do that, I, okay. I guess. I mean. Uh, so that there's a, some casual throwing, that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. From, uh, mm -hmm. The use of baseball fields shall be limited to the hours of five to dusk for organized practices, Monday through Friday. How about that? Organized uses. Okay, organized. Okay. Did everybody catch that? <laughs> and did you address seven also? Was that? Yeah, I eliminated oh, seven. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I second as much. All right, so a motion by Mr. Horsley with all the changes and a second by Mr. Alcarez. Mr. Alcarez? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Nay. Uh, Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By recorded vote of eight in favor, one against, agenda item number 15 has been recommended for approval with conditions one, two, four, seven, eight, and 10 as modified. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we're on to short term rentals, 19 and 20. Okay, our next agenda items are 19 and 20. Kim Davenport, an application for a conditional use permit, short-term rental on property located at 8809 Atlantic Avenue, units A and B in the Lynn Haven District. I should have told you. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Please state your name for the record. 
Kim Davenport. Okay. Um, I'd like good afternoon uh, to the members of the Planning Commission. I appreciate the time you give us to have our input on these subjects. Um, I'm here today to hopefully convince the Virginia Beach Planning Commission to recommend my Atlantic Avenue residents for a conditional use permit to allow short-term rentals. My wife Jeannie and I bought the 8809 Atlantic Avenue in late 2018 to use as a rental and hopefully one day be able to afford to make the North End property our permanent residence. The property is a duplex with the size, location, and layout suited as a vacation type cottage. It was on the market for four months with no buyers. Prospective owners did not find it financially viable or didn't want to put the time and money in for repairs and upgrades it needed. And the lot was not big enough to make a financial profit by raising the cottage and making it a three-story monolithic monstrosity duplex. This was fortunate for myself and my wife as we love the property as it is with its old fashioned charm. We would never invest in a property that we would not love to live in as our own residence. When we purchased the residence, it was unoccupied, rundown, and in disrepair. We spent the next six months renovating, landscaping, and furnishing the property to restore it to its original intended use as a beach cottage. We intended initially to keep it as a monthly rental, but found it was more suitable for a weekly rental. Each unit is a very small two bedroom, one and a half bath with fireplace and a very small lot with no real yard to speak of. It was built to be used as a summer cottage with both units sharing a common laundry room. Each duplex is 900 square foot, can accommodate a family of four, maybe six with pre-teenage children. The back unit has a small deck that is completely enclosed with a six foot privacy fence. The front unit has little more outdoor area but still has a small deck enclosed by a continuation of the six foot privacy fence, followed by a 20 foot length of a small picket fence to 89th Street. Once zoning approves the parking spots to put in, the outdoor area will be reduced further and the patio will be more of a walkway. On the other side of the property from the six foot privacy fence is Atlantic Avenue with no adjacent neighbors. The point I'm trying to stress is that there is no space available for outdoor activities or any, of any size, and since we have owned the property, there has been no social gatherings or outdoor events except a family meal or enjoying an adult beverage on a picnic table. To my knowledge, to date, there have been no complaints from any neighbor for any reason. But in fact, we have been repeatedly told by the neighbor that the vacation renters we were renting to were always pleasant and considerate. As to parking issues, there have never been any complaints or violations. Uh, as a short-term family rental, most occupants have one car, on occasion maybe two. When we put in the recently zoning, zoned approval four brick paver parking spots on the 89th Street side, we will actually increase the neighborhood parking by freeing up the four spots on the Atlantic Avenue easement we currently use for parking. This can be seen on the site plan submitted with my CUP application. The research and investigation into understanding the parking issues is one of the reasons I was late in filing for my CUP. I've learned a valuable lesson that if I ever attempt to buy a resident in an older neighborhood again, that I make sure the perceived parking spots that are shown on the site plan, that I make sure the perceived parking spots are shown on the site plan and within the boundaries of the purchased property. The renters move the trash receptacles to the street on a trash pickup day and then back to the side of the property afterwards. If they don't do it, our cleaners do. If our cleaners don't do it, then Jeannie or myself will drive down to the property and move them. We have security cameras and monitor them carefully for the safety of our renters and security of the property when not occupied. Again, we have never heard or seen of any issues except an occasional lockout or renter unable to open a key box. We do not allow pets as there have, so there are no barking dogs to annoy the neighbors. Before I was aware of the short-term rental CUP requirements, we did do some summer rentals in 2020. 
I've submitted a list of those for your review so you have an understanding of the type of people and renters who use the property. The overwhelming number of them are small families, as you can see. They are grateful and impressed with the natural beauty, quaintness, and charge of ch charm of the North End. And it is this, for this reason, they prefer the location as opposed to the crowds and the noise of the resort area. There is no difference between the residents being owner-occupied or visitor vacation renter-occupied. Both have cars, both used in the neighborhood for transportation and for using local parking spots. So the traffic is the same. Both have occupants. So the number of residents in the neighborhood are the same. Both use the beaches, trails, bike paths, outdoor activities. So the, out, so the outdoor activities are the same. One difference is that an owner-occupied property will not give Virginia Beach the benefit of the lodging tax revenue. Another difference is with the short-term rental, you have a new family each week enjoying the North End Virginia Beach experience. For the beauty, the beach creating new once-in-a-lifetime family memories by enjoying the North End Maritime Forest and the Atlantic Ocean Beach. First Landing State Park, biking trails, local sites, and enjoying local restaurants. If the Civic League did not want a short-term rental, I'm sure it wouldn't prefer a long-term group house rental by a dozen group friends staying there over the, the summer. This would not be overseen and managed as well as a short-term rental. I myself and a group of friends did a short a rental when I was younger and I would never do this to my property or to my neighbors. If the property is, is not available for the short-term rental, then it would most likely alternative is a monthly to annual rental. There is no for which there would be no Virginia lodging tax revenue. And it would probably be rented to a younger non-married individual and be susceptible to non-tenant overnight stays parties with their friends. If the tenant turned out to be bad and created the type of neighborhood disturbances the Civil League is concerned with, then it would take three months to evict them, if at all. The advantage of the short-term rental is the risk is with the owner of losing the conditional use permit and the owner must be extra vigilant and proactive to make sure the laws are complied with and the guests are managed. About a month ago, there was a justifiable outcry from the, from the neighbors for the, and from the speakers at the different commission sessions for a three-day all-night party and a discharge of a firearm that took place several, about a month ago. However, I believe the blame and perpetrator of this incident directed at illegal short-term rental was not justifiable. As I understand, the residence was not a legally permitted short-term rental and it was, in fact, was a rogue resident owner allowing this rude and unacceptable behavior. If it was a legally permitted short-term rental, the owner would never have allowed it, knowing their permit would be revoked. And if I'm wrong and it was a legal CUP short-term rental, I would be the first to insist that the CUP is revoked. Any, any questions? Yeah, I'm have a question. Um, I saw that your um, application was submitted early November of 2020. When did you discontinue your short-term rentals? It was at that time. Okay, so no rentals after November 2020. Correct. When I started, I was. I registered with the business revenue, thinking that was all I needed to do because it was an application for a short-term rental. Over time, and trying to keep up with the laws, I found out I was mistaken. So we, we filed the application. We canceled all future rentals and returned their deposits. And since then, I have rented to long-term renters. Uh, and I've had family and friends and myself use the mm -hmm. residence. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Tahan, we are engaged in an ongoing conversation with the Commissioner of Revenue to make sure that they share that information with registrants, right? Yes. <laughs> we, we do the best we can to share the information as, as much as possible. It's, Again. it's well documented. You say it on all your applications. So Correct. once the application is submitted. Sir, hold, hold on one second. Let, Mr. Mr. Sorry. No, it's, we, we do our best to make sure we relay the information. Again, a lot of people have been submitting things online, but 
yes, we have been in constant discussion and review with the Commissioner of Revenue to make sure that we're sharing that information. Is it possible to get something added to the Commissioner of Revenue application? Would that be an option if it, they're doing it online? Um, we, we can ask. <laughs> we, we will ask. Thank you. They, so any business license, well. Do a comment? Um, there is a. No, I was just going to say we, we can't force them to do that. Bobby's right. We can just ask nicely. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. There, there is a, again, typically if they're getting their business license, they are required to uh, get zoning approval, which is how we catch a number of these as well. Um, it is different if they are just registering to pay the amount. Uh, that means they're probably represented by a real estate company, and so they typically just register them and take the money. So, Sir, did you go down in person to the um, Commissioner of Revenue's office to register? No, I did not. You did not? Okay. A um, couple of questions I have for you, sir, is when you were renting short term, you rented it according to all your um, letters at least 64 times, which is a, that's a, quite a bit, including your cleaning lady who said, you know, and they were all, they're all great reviews, obviously, but there's 64 reviews, which means that you've rented it 64 separate times. And being at the, I, I noticed that you mentioned the North End Civic League. The North End Civic League is a pretty loud Civic League, and they do put out a newsletter and an email, and they collect dues. And so I've just, it's interesting to me that you didn't, it, during this time that you've owned this property and have been renting it all, all along, that you were unaware that you needed a CUP, because that Civic League is. I, I was white. never notified by anyone. I talked to my neighbors. They, I, I have one adjacent neighbor who I talk to on a regular basis. They did not mention it. Um, I did not hear it from the Civic League. Well, the I, Civic League's not going to reach out to you, but the Civic League, that Civic League specifically is very large, very loud, and well, it, communicates the, very well with pretty much everybody there. They put flyers in the in the um, mailboxes. I mean, that that's a I, I can't speak for that. I No, I was not contacted. And this was over a period of late 2019, uh, 2020. Any more questions? All right, thank you, sir. I don't think there are any more speakers, correct? We're gonna thank you for your time. Thank you. We're going to close this and open up for discussion. We don't have a Lynn Haven representative. Who's oh, closest to Rip? Yeah, who's closest to Lynn Haven Beach? <laughs> I'll start it. Okay. I um, I'm familiar with this street just because my grandparents lived on this street, um, pretty much all my life. There's no parking on this street whatsoever, <clears throat> or around the corner, or on the ocean side of this street at all, and um. I just have a, a problem with somebody that's, he's been operating for, well, he bought it in 2018, started renting it, and he's rented it um, a lot, and he's short on his parking to boot. And so I just, I just have a, I can't, I'm not going to support this application, but that's okay. where I am. Anyone else? Jack? Turn your mic on. Um, it's just for staff, and it's the map um, updated on 3-11-2021. It's just a formality, but it, you know, before, if it goes to council, I, I think that blue dot is supposed to be a yellow, because you know, it's showing as registered. Or maybe that is right. That is the problem, is that it is registered as, that is correct. Is okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks. Any other comments? I'm going to make one because I'm the one that actually brought this up that I couldn't support this. Um, and I've, the sign's been up for a long time, and I've ridden by it quite a few times. And I actually walked around it one time and waiting for the staff report to come out. I couldn't, I didn't know where anybody was going to park because there's no parking. 
And when I read the staff report that they were going to cut trees down to make a, make a driveway, um, you know how I feel about pouring concrete for driveways. I definitely cannot support cutting trees down for a driveway. So I'm not going to support this one either. So anybody want to make a motion? Um, I'm sorry? We need a motion. I'll make a motion to deny. I'm sorry? No, no, no sir. We're already done with the word. Make a motion to deny application agenda item number 19 and 20. You got a second? Second. We have a second. We have a motion by Mrs. Oliver and a second by Mr. Acres. Yes. A motion is to deny the application. Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By a recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against. Agenda items 19 and 20 have been denied. Right, on to 21. Agenda item 21, Carrie Burnham, an application for a conditional use permit, short-term rental on property located at 400 Norfolk Avenue, Unit B in the Beach District. Welcome, sir. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Carrie Burnham. Uh, good afternoon. Chairman and committee members, uh, I'm here seeking your approval recommendation to the city council for conditional use permit for short-term rental. Uh, my wife and I purchased the three-bedroom condo on Norfolk Avenue in December, um, and we love the idea of being able to walk to the beach and spending time there with family and friends and just being able to walk back to our condo and rinse it off and enjoy the rest of the evening. We also had thought about the uh, chance to do short-term rental um, when we purchased, and that's obviously some of the direction we want to go into the future, along with spending time there ourselves. Um, our children and grandchildren are local. Uh, we've been members of, uh, residents of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach for 30 plus years, 21 of those being in Virginia Beach just never got close enough to the ocean front like we always wanted and we're there now but I don't know that we're going to spend all our time there because we also own a home in Chesapeake and I do some traveling as a defense contractor as well uh, to put the application in and there was um, the parking wasn't wide enough in one section of the driveway so you know this this is our home this is me and my wife's home we may end up retiring there at some time we didn't see the feasibility of just adding a foot of concrete that was going to be different color than the rest of the con concrete. So right now, as we speak, Winesett Nursery is out there, and I'm having them do a foot all around the driveway of decorative concrete pavers so it looks cosmetically appealing to the eye. We want to be good neighbors. Um, speaking of being good neighbors, I've spoken to three neighbors, two that are immediately beside me, and the one immediately behind me where both of our driveways empty out at the same spot onto 9th Street. Um, the one that I really want to express the fact that being a good neighbor is imp important to us is the one that we share this condo unit with, the, uh, the two people that own uh, 400A as we own 400B. And I looked, I looked all these neighbors in the eye and I said these exact words. It is extremely important to us to be a good neighbor above all. All those neighbors have my wife and my personal cell number. I have security cameras on the um, outside of the property. And I, whoever ends up renting this, if that, if that happens, I plan on meeting those families in person, saying, hey, th this is what we're all about, and being a good neighbor is the utmost important to us. And all of those neighbors, I have their contact number, they have mine, are in support of us doing this. Um, 
and we just want to be good neighbors. I don't know how else to put that. It's important to us in our home in Chesapeake right now, and it's just as important to us at our condo that we just purchased in December. Um, just This is new to us. We've never do, done any type of short-term rental, so we did extreme research, and uh, we asked the realtor when we bought the place, and you know, she sent us to the VBGov slash STR website, and we've just done the application and, you know, everything like we've been told and we're supposed to, and um, I'm standing by for any questions. Any questions? I have a question. Yes, are sir. you are you, you who, what realty company are you using a realty company rent right now for for renting or are you doing it yourself no, my, I, myself so who's so if there's a problem where you have to be on site within a certain amount of time is that you yes sir me and my wife will drive from my home in chesapeake to our condo okay all right no questions thank you sir yes sir oh hold on a second I got one question. Yes, you sir. said that you all plan to use it, Chef. Approximately how much do you plan to use it? Or are you just going to get locked into renting it and just stay there one week a year or something? Is I, I, sir, I wish I could give you a number. If it was up to my wife, we would move in there right now and sell our Chesapeake home. If this was up to me, we would do it 50% of the time and, and help support the income with two mortgages. I, you know, I wish I could give you a number on that, but that's our two different opinions. And... If you've been married for a long time, you'll know that it's probably going to lean more towards what she wants and not what I want. You know, that's yeah, well, I've been married a long time. <laughs> yeah. I Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> we have no speakers. No speakers. All right. We're going to open it up for discussion. Well, this is definitely George. Well, I did ask to hear it because... Uh, my concern was the close proximity of the neighbor next door. Um, I understand it's, uh, I take it, it is a condo or it's a duplex condo, individually owned. Uh, I know he's increasing the uh, parking area so he can um, meet those requirements, um, two on site and one in the garage. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen to you if you guys have any concerns. I don't think I'm supporting it unless I can be swayed differently, but because of the closeness of the adjoining property. It looks like there they're, they're, uh, they're side doors there, and I see a fireplace on the side. I see, so it's probably a living room window there, and I just, uh, I'm, I'm all about enjoyment, quite enjoyment at your home, so those are my Mrs. comments. Mrs. Klein? Um, I'm inclined to approve it. It sounds like they really did their due diligence uh, when purchasing the property, and I, mm. Um, so I applaud them. I applaud their realtor for providing them with accurate information. Um, and I think that that is a testament to the type of homeowners and property managers that they would be moving forward. Okay. Mrs. Oliver. So I, as much as I appreciate his sincerity, um, my problem is that, you know, these run with the land. And as good as a landlord he would be, I would imagine the fact that it is connected to another building that somebody else lives in and these run with the land, uh, that's, what, that's what gives me heartburn. Because if they decide they're gonna sell in a few years, then somebody else buys it, we've got a duplex with a family or whomever is on the other side that's invested their life savings for a home and now we've got this short-term rental operating differently and that's that's where i stand with these that are connected to each other can you put time limit no because the conditional use permits for short-term rentals are five years right am i correct for five years so it has to be that time limit's already in the ordinance of five years I mean, technically, there is a time limit already, so you could recommend a shorter one. Um, really? Y you can. Okay, I mean, we'll it is a, this. as far as it having to come up. All it will do will say it will come up for administrative review and renewal at a sooner time frame. Uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for staff. It doesn't mean it will go away. Um, you can't. I don't think we've been comfortable doing. Have we been comfortable doing the we time frame for a conditional use permit since it runs with the land? I don't think so. We were told we couldn't do. 
Could we do something like make a condition that they have to notify the planning office if they sell the property? No? Um, hmm. Technically, if someone wanted to operate a new short term, I, I, I'm trying to understand what the where we're trying to, I guess what we're trying to find. Uh, you can't condition. limit it to an individual. If that's what you're trying to get at, that cannot be done. Well, my, I, okay. So my thought is, I have the property and I'm selling it, so I'm letting the office know, hey, I'm the short term rental I had. I'm now moving from this property, so then the planning department can be on notice to either look for a new permit or complaints or whatever for that property. Uh, we were always told, I'm going to tell you what we've, what we've talked about before in the past in many years is we can't do that because the conditional use permit runs with the property. If it's been sold, it doesn't matter. It's still running with the property. So you can't stop the conditional use permit just because the man sold it. But this is the first I'm hearing because I know we've talked about time limits on these things and I was always under the impression it was five years. We, had, we couldn't make... Um, uh, um, come back administratively review in two, one year, two year, or three years. I didn't know that. I, I would have well, done some of this a long time ago. Well, I, I think maybe you've been told, and I'm sorry, Mr. Enman, I, and I think you have a comment, so I'll step back. No, go ahead. Um, I think the discussion that's been told is that you can't limit, you can't, there is no comfort to say this goes away in two years. The conditional use permit goes away in two years. <laughs> what the in 241.2, the zoning ordinance, it says that the conditional use permit shall come up for review, uh, shall expire after five years and come up for administrative review. That's, that's what the ordinance says. After five years? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. But what if, we put, what if we make a condition of one year? We can't do that. It's unfair. Oh, my, my. Yeah, I mean. It's unfair. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I, I mean, that's what I was always told. So I, that's why I've always said we couldn't do a time limit because or we can't do because it's five years on a, on a conditional use permit. I mean, again, it doesn't, if it needs to come up for, again, this is discussing the coming up for review portion, right? So uh, understanding that if we get constant complaints for a short-term rental, we're going to bring it back to city council to revoke it. We're not, go, we're not, so regardless of it's five years, two years, one year, if I get three safety complaints or one, two safety complaints that are egregious, I'm, I'm bringing it back to city council to, to get it revoked. So, I mean, that's, I don't know if there's any comfort in the number, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it does. It, you know, you know, and I, I see where Robin's coming from because you get a very sincere gentleman to come in here, you know, it's, it acts like he's done all his homework. And then if for some reason in, in four or five years he gets ready to sell it and then you sell it to anybody, you, you will sell it to anybody and they may not be as, you know, as you, don't know what, you don't know what kind of uh, tally they keeping on the, on the property, you know. Uh, but, so, so, anyway. I'm I, I, I would anyway. offer to, to address that concern. If you look at the staff report on page five where condition eight is, Condition eight is one that's a standard condition where it requires the, the owner of the property, uh, if it changes, they're responsible to notify the new property owner to come get a, to come register with the city. Hmm. So this is a standard condition that's already there. Yeah, it's already in there, right? They don't care. They, sold the <laughs> they just don't do that. I don't think that's happening. Mr. Edmund, <laughs> Mr. Edmund wants to make a comment. Well, I, I find that this is a tough one for a couple of reasons. One, I, I do want to support what other people are saying as we experienced city council last week, you know, we got to be conscious that there, can, that a property could be resold any time. Mm -hmm. But if that's becoming a, a major focus, um, then we can't approve anything. I mean, if, if, that, if you're concerned, so concerned about that, how, but so we got to look at the review process as being the fallback as the safety valve, so to speak, um, and the ability to bring it up for review if there are problems at any time that the, the planning department becomes adequately or the zoning officer becomes adequately alerted to those things. So, you know, I think we, like you say, we have a good applicant. Okay, now, what, what about where this property is located? It's in the resort area. 
we got a street behind them, we got a street in front of them, we got an on an intersection. I, I know that they're the interior unit of that thing, but that, you know, the, it, it's not like it's in a really dense area. Um, you know, it to me, it's one of those that if, if you if you meet all the criteria and you look at where it's lo located, hard to say. I, I don't I don't see much reason to, to say no because you're worried about somebody selling it next year. They're all anybody, any of for anyone we've approved can sell it next year, so, next week. So, Mike, where I was going, it wasn't just that, and and I agree with you on a lot of points, but it's it's the fact that it is a it's a duplex. I, I so. Hear there's always it's it's married to another building to another right. family that's invested and so that's what gives me heartburn yeah. with it so when you look at these duplexes and that's you know what how does that work out and the fact that it is such a close proximity to the ocean front yeah it's a it's a it's a great place for a short-term rental but it is also a great place for a short-term rental so <laughs> <laughs> which means that it has all the components to be what we've had a problem with and i'm not it has nothing personally about it it's just to this gentleman i, I think he is he he's would be great it's just the fact that it is connected to another family that owns a building and and it runs with the land and this is this is where we are so um mr carson uh unfortunately this is the life that we live and uh, uh i think we do a lot of condos in that area a lot of other multifamily type setups uh I want to think we've approved a couple very close to this, maybe on the other side of the street. Uh, and when you get a good uh, tenant, if you're a landlord, you're happy. You deal with the bad one when you get them and you put them out. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the life of the rental business. Uh, and it's probably the life of the tenant business for us as representatives of the city. Uh, I think it's wonderful that he's done a great job, and I don't, don't think we should penalize him for that. I think we should applaud him. Mr. Inman. I make a motion to approve the application. Jackson, I second. You got a motion to second? Jack, do you want to say anything? I got, well, I got, I'm torn. I don't know which way to go. I don't know how to vote right now. Um, I, I agree. I've, I've ridden by the site in the last 30 days, probably 20 times. And I, I've thought to myself, wow, it's, it's, it's good, but as Dee says, it's a duplex. What's going to happen in the future? But I, I don't know. Well, I think John makes an excellent point, is we have not only approved single-family homes. You know, we've approved mm -hmm. individual um, residences within condo buildings where there are people who share walls. Mm -hmm. um, so while I am concerned about those people as well, this isn't an out of the ordinary um, approval, wouldn't be out of the ordinary for us. And one thing Mike said also, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a house that's not in a dense area. You got a street in front of it, you got a street behind it, you got a big, you got a nice driveway. Uh, Jack. One thing is, Did I you get a second on that? Yes, you did get a second on that. Oh, okay. okay. But hold on, yeah. So we're yeah, we'll vote in here. Still comment, yeah. commenting. Yep. Um, is that you know we're we're consistent on what we and you know, how we apply it um, you know, from one application to the next. The um, you know I've heard some whew, some horror stories of duplex you know the north end where it, it, it's shared parking, um, the driveway is shared, and it's it is a challenge on. Um, for the adjacent owner to to keep them out, but in this case, it's the parking is separate. So this is you know I don't, I don't know if it's a qualifier, but it it may help me make a decision um, just because there's there's separate parking and they're they're facing opposite ways. Um, but I you know we have other applications you know in this um, today you know they're duplexes so yeah it's something to consider. Thanks. One other thing I want to add, too, if there was any opposition standing here in front of us today, I would be thinking differently. So I think I'm going to have to support this one. 
So we have a, a motion for approval by Mr. Inman and a second by Mrs. Klein. Okay. Mr. Alcaraz? Nay. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Nay. Mr. Redmond is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By a recorded vote of six in favor and two against, agenda item number 21 has been recommended for approval. Right. On item 22. Okay, agenda item 22, David and Nancy Drogas, an application for a conditional use permit, short-term rental on property located at 117 73rd Street, Unit A in the Lynn Haven District. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, good afternoon. And uh, thank you to all of you for allowing me the opportunity to come in here on behalf of my wife and I to get our... Please state your name for the record. Oh, uh, David Drogas. I'm sorry. Uh, my wife, Nancy, and I are, are thrilled to have the opportunity to come down here. Uh, I want you to approve our conditional use permit for the condo that we just recently acquired. We bought the condo in uh, November 2020. So we've only had it for a few months. So we haven't had any real opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to upset anybody or upset any of the neighbors. I know there's a couple of letters in opposition, but I don't, I don't even know them. Uh, just wanted to assure all of you that to start off, I'm not interested in doing any uh, Airbnb type of scenarios. Our short term is going to be a minimum uh, of seven nights in a row, moving on like throughout the summertime. Short term rental, seven nights, not weekends, not a couple nights here, people coming in and out. Uh, I wanted to share with you my background. I have been in real estate, I'm a, a managing broker for Rosenwamble Realty. I've been in real estate now for 35 years. I've been managing uh, the Greenbrier office in Chesapeake of Rosenwamble for the last 26 years, I guess. Uh, long time. Uh, so this is, this is uh, we own rental property, my wife and I. Uh, I manage all my own rental property. Uh, I've been doing it personally and professionally now for over 24 years. But all the rental property that we own is all single family homes and one of them is a duplex. Uh, so they're long term rentals and they're in, uh, all but one of them are in Virginia Beach. One of them is in Chesapeake. So everything is a year or a minimum on a, on a lease. But I'm used to dealing with tenants, used to been dealing with real estate. So this is not an experiment for us getting into this uh, type of scenario. Uh, to backtrack for a moment, we, we, my wife and I came to Virginia Beach in 1978 on our honeymoon. A year later, from Youngstown, Ohio. A year later, we were living and owned property in Virginia Beach in 1979. We moved here. We've been here permanently. Our kids grew up. We live in Kempsville uh, Borough in uh, Virginia Beach. Uh, my daughters went to Kempsville High School, graduated. My oldest daughter was actually a, uh, a lifeguard during her college years at the oceanfront. Uh, we love the city. We love being here. We love going down and enjoying the amenities all, all throughout the city, but certainly the oceanfront area. So we were excited when the opportunity came up to invest in something like this uh, after all these years. We're not getting any younger, and we were thinking that, well, do we want to buy something where we can maybe go and sneak off and vacation a little bit in North Carolina, Florida, whatever? But the answer was, you know, it's hard to get there. We can jump in our car in 20 minutes. We can be at the condo if that's what we intend to do. But we also intend to have it uh, on a, uh, a short-term rental basis, uh, primarily during the summer. Uh, during the winter months, it would be no less than probably a three-month uh, rental for a winter rental. And then we would sneak in there when, when, it's, when it's ever it's vacant or it's empty, uh, not being occupied. The, uh, thing I think it's important to understand too is that we are going to, uh, even though I'm, I'm a real estate broker and, and been doing this for a long time and managing my own properties, I'm not intending to manage this property. We're going to have the property professionally managed by Atkinson Realty, Ms. Amber Parker, who's going to come up here and speak in a few moments. 
You know, I learned a long time ago, when you want something done right, you turn it over to the professionals that that's all they do, or that's what they do best. My company doesn't handle short-term rentals. Uh, so I'm not gonna turn it over to my company. I'm gonna go with the guys, the pros that know how to do it, and that's what they do down at the beach. So they'll be looking over this property, and uh, she will speak a little bit more to that. But it will be uh, the, the, the scenario that we have, we feel we have met the criteria in terms of the, uh, uh, my property has four bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms. It's 1,700 square feet. So it doesn't really allow itself to be like for a large family home uh, on a year term rental. This is people are going to come in for a week and then they're going to leave. They're going to go, you know, they're coming for a vacation. It's a resort town. It's, it's uh, tourist. So we're going to have, uh, have it set up that... Well, we not have it set up. It's set up. We have four bedrooms. We have four parking spaces. I understand that that is the criteria. They're, they're designated parking spaces. And then we are also attached to the unit, unit B, which is another condo behind us, who also has four parking spaces. They're all side by side. They're all uh, off street. And our unit uh, is, is right on Atlantic Avenue. So we have no neighbors to, the, to that side just Atlantic Avenue, you come right in on 73rd Street and boom, you're home. You're right there at the, uh, at the condo, so it's easy to get to. My understanding, uh, well, the people that we bought this from, as it turns out, uh, they didn't live there. They were out from Richmond and they, they rented it out. They had it going on uh, uh, weekly rentals and they would come down and stay and that sort of thing and they have apparently retired and moved to New Jersey. We don't know them. It's, it's not like that. Their daughter owns the backside, B. She doesn't live there either, and it's generally empty. It's generally vacant, but they do rent that out from what I understand. I've never met any of them, so I, I, I can't speak to it. I just know that right now that Unit B is empty. There's nobody staying there, and uh, so it's not... Not like it's a, a family living back there. Now all of a sudden we have tourists coming in to our property in the summertime. So we don't, we don't really have that going on. Uh, I, I don't really, I've not had privy to, to, to look at the letters. I understand there was a couple of uh, letters in opposition from some of the neighbors. Again, we've only been there since November. haven't owned it long enough to make anybody upset yet. And we don't intend to do that either. So I think that uh, whatever, whatever the opposition would be, I'm not really sure, because we're, I think, you know, 73rd Street, you know, and then we're 50 yards to the beach. So there's only like seven houses on each side of 53rd Street, and then you're at the beach. We're all the way at the Atlantic Avenue section or, or, or location. So we're really not deep into the neighborhood. So I don't know how it's disturbing anybody. And frankly, it's been a short-term rental, uh, my understanding, for quite a number of years with the people that used to own it. I bought it. I mean, I'm in real estate. I've got a license. We're going to do things right. That's why we went with number one, Atkinson Realty, and number one, A, is submitted the application for the short-term rental uh, conditional use permit because that's the proper thing to do in the city of Virginia Beach. And uh, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to do it. Uh, so I think that I'm, I'm not exactly sure what any opposition would be. I know that any noise level that anybody's concerned about is we've got the most noise level if you <laughs> on Atlantic Avenue, particularly I can imagine on, in the summertime. It is very, very busy, so you really can't open your windows in, the, in that property. Uh, as far as tenants, you know, you've got there for a week. If they're not good people, out they go. Uh, I manage it. All of our rental properties that my wife and I own, you could drive by any one of them in any neighborhood that they're located and not be able to pick out that it's a rental. We meticulously maintain our properties. We expect our tenants to do the same. And if they don't, out they go. Uh, so that's it's really how we operate. It's how we intend to operate with, with 73rd Street. We're very excited to, uh, to, to own that property. and. Uh, and to enjoy our, our life here in Virginia Beach and continue to do so uh, as, as we go on down the road. Uh, I really open up for uh, any questions that you all might have. Uh, we really hope that you will uh, consider the approval of, uh, of this for the short-term rental period. 
understanding, and I'll, I would put in writing or however you want to do it, that it will not be for any less than a seven night, seven night period. Because the, 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 uh, the uh, bed and breakfast, or not bed and bread, the, uh, the other type of rental. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your comments. People any come questions? And go. I did. Questions? Oh, we, have also, we have a question. I did. Yes, sir. Um, with the, um, the map for the parking, Yes. it says that um, you've gotten a letter for an encroachment into the um, unit B's, which is the adjacent property owner's 20-foot right. uh, parking easement. Right. How much of that 20-foot easement are you talking about? It, it's, it's very, very deceiving. And, and I, have a, I have a fresh survey from Alpha Tech that kind of helps uh, clear it up a little bit more. I, I have one for each of you if you would like. But I'd like to see how, that. How, it, how it works is there, there is no, and if you, if you go and look at the unit, you'll Excuse see. Me, hold on one second. Can you give that to this young oh, lady? Sure, absolutely. Here, so we absolutely. Can, yeah, we can look at go. that, please. There's a couple of them. Here, I'll give you a couple more. There you are. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, as you look at, if you go and were to drive down there, you would see four clearly marked parking spots. Unit A, which is mine, is to the far left, and there's two. And they're nine feet wide. Uh, 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 it's very wide. And then there's unit B has their two spots, and then right behind, so you stack the cars, you've got four more spaces right across there. So what, why this is showing three, obviously you're gonna park a car behind number two on the, on the sheet. So you can put four parking, I mean literally no problem. I have a large SUV and we've parked several vehicles down there at the same time. There's plenty of room all the way across for four across up by the fence and then four behind us. Okay, well my, my point, and uh, Mr. Wiener hear me out on this, um, Looks like you got 36 feet. Is that correct? 36 uh, feet wide. Uh, yes, the 36 right. feet. But then if you go all the way over, it's 50 feet. If you look on that survey I just gave you. Yeah, my, my concern is if you're acquiring part of their two nine foot wide parking spaces in that 20 foot, what does that leave them with? Because they have to have their ad adequate parking also. Right, and that's that's where it's that's very. That's where I'm getting confused with this. I the see what old, you yeah, the old survey that was mm -hmm. done, and that's what Will had. Uh, well, where did he get this from? He got the the old one. The old survey he got from the, the from the city. Yeah, I okay. uh, from that. The new one I just had done. He's not even seen what you're, is in your hand right now that I just passed out. So let me. I think this. So 36 feet is, uh, is concrete wide, mm -hmm. two spaces is 18, so you, then you should be good on the A unit, and then it looks like you should be good on the B unit. No. Th that is correct. Okay, it's just it's this just, drawing that we have in front of us and this, the way that Mr. Miller has drawn it, it yeah. looks like you've taken their parking. Yeah, I know, it, and then we haven't. There's, there's ample space, everybody has equal space for- So crime. why did you need the encroachment letter then? Uh, that's what Will asked, but that was before I got the survey that you have in your hand that I just passed out. He was looking at the first thing you were looking at. Hold on one second, sir. Mr. DeHaan, do you want to comment? Mr. Alcaraz, to help kind of point it out, as you're looking at the survey, if you look uh, right above where it says four marked spaces, it, it notes that there's a 20 by 20 ingress egress parking easement for unit B per the plot. He's encroaching into that ingress egress easement, uh, which is noted here also on the screen. Um, Based on that dimension, he's encroaching into their into their easement by four feet and from from right to left. So, um, so and what? Hold will, on, let me let me finish. Oh, sorry. Sure. And so, it looks like we're okay with parking because yeah. originally what was sent to us, uh, it just sure. it took away sorry. from the parking. So it looks like we're we're good, right? Correct. Yes, there's enough room to meet the minimum parking space size. Right. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Mr. Chair, we have one speaker. Okay. Amber Parker. <clears throat> Welcome. Hi. Good afternoon, Planning Commission members. My name is Amber Parker. I'm the Vacation Manager for Atkinson Realty a firm I've worked with for 16 years. 
And I'm here today to ask for your approval for a conditional use permit for the application from Mr. and Mrs. Drogas for their property at 73rd Street. And thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> um, as you heard from Mr. Drogas, he is a broker for Rose and Womble, has experience in rental properties, but he chose Atkinson Realty because we built an excellent short-term rental program. We maintain a harmonious relationship with our owners, guests, and the STR neighbors. The, manning, the planning commission may not be aware, but before we'll take on any property, we go to the home, meet the owners, make sure it's stacking some realty standards, and go over the city ordinance requirements. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> city, city ordinance requirements for the SDRs, and Mr. and Mrs. Rogas understood that. They had, knew they had to file for the CUP. I went over the Atkinson Realty expectations. I answered their questions. And one important aspect to note is that we will not list any new home for rental until it has been approved for their CUP. As a result of the recent COVID-19, sanitized quality STRs are in high demand. STRs like the Drogas' Home provide a viable vacation alternative to families seeking private accommodations for their families while vacationing in our wonderful city. To the neighbors of our STR rental applicants or the concerned citizens, I'd like to address some of the concerns that have been repeatedly mentioned in previous meetings. Hopefully this will put your mind at ease. It's one of the reasons that the druggist has selected Atkinson Realty. One of the most vital things that we offer is constant contact with the families that book an Atkinson Realty vacation. We speak with the families vacationing with us before they make the reservation. When they make the reservation, we process their payments. We reach out to them to give them information for when they check in, which all of them are required to do at our office so we can meet them before they go to the property. Um, we do not want unruly guests. The neighbors don't want unruly guests. And what we do to keep that from happening is we have somebody on call 24 seven from the office, our staff. We live here, we work here, we play here and we care. We also maintain the SDR's curb appeal year round through our landscaping, maintenance and property care programs. We also offer Saturday trash pickup during the summer season. Over the past 16 years, typically the calls that we receive would be Wi-Fi not working, cable uh, after our guests who inadvertently locked themselves out, so we bring them a key. Uh, we occasionally have an appliance or an HVAC call. It also may help to point out that our staff goes to the rental before and after every guest arrives. The property is then cleaned, sanitized, and inspected. And I would welcome any of the neighbors of Mr. Drogas, if they have questions or concerns, to reach out to me. I'd be happy to address the concerns anybody may have here today. And in conclusion, the Drogas' property. Thank you very much for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank any you for questions? your time and consideration. <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, I was nervous. Any more speakers? No more speakers. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. DeHaan, did you I got your hand up? Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, Based on the information that was said by the applicant that it had operated previously as a short-term rental, we had now contacted the Commissioner of Revenue and the property is actually grandfathered. So the applicant- This one is? This property is grandfathered oh, to operate. Okay, well, we don't have to vote on this. So my suggestion at this point would be to continue the item um, so that we can make sure we get all the paperwork from the applicant and uh, then he can, we can withdraw it at the next meeting. Okay. So we want to, is that a deferral? We deferred or discontinuance? We just do withdrawal? It's just there. He doesn't need to be here then. Sorry, we're, we're debating. It's fine. Take, take your time. You, you're, you're the. Uh, it, it is possible that you could still make a recommendation. My, my concern about making a recommendation is that the. Yeah, if it's grandfather, we shouldn't have to do anything but defer right. it or withdraw it. Really, withdraw it. Correct.
Let us talk to the applicant, if you don't mind. I'm Ms. sorry, Mr. Chair. Can I, you want to talk to him? Yes. Ms. You want to come up here? Yeah. Mr. Jaggers, you want to come up here, please? We've, we've um, recently found out that your property has been rented and it's been grand, it's grandfathered, which means that. you don't, well, he's been making a decision now, but you won't need a conditional use permit. I'm good with that. With this, but hang on, stand by one second. We're not there yet. Yeah, you don't get a refund. Huh? <laughs> you don't so, get a refund. I'll tell you what, it'll be my contribution. <laughs> Again, I'm, well, I'm happy just, to do it. I'm just uh, kidding. The information uh, wasn't provided to staff until recently about the operation previously. So, uh, Mr. Dragos, do you have some options, I believe? So, it isn't really zero on it, but you could. Right. Let's just drop it down and pull it. Mr. Chairman, I right. got some. We can go ahead and do it. Just on the, it's probably better just to do it on the record, right? Right. Well, so uh, the option is yours, Mr. Dragos, to continue forward or not, if you like. The information we have received at this point from the Commissioner of Revenue doing uh, additional research after you stated that this operated previous to 2018 um, notes that it is considered a grandfather property. Beautiful. Okay. Now, that being said, you have the option to either defer it, request that the Planning Commission vote on it, or withdraw the application in front of the commission right now and you don't have to make that standing here you, if you need a moment to i mean it's kind of a no-brainer isn't it to withdraw the application if we're grandfathered then we're done yeah. you guys keep the <laughs> keep the application fee on me it's not a problem and that's fine have you gone to the register have you registered yet at all no sir no What well, register yeah, for you what? Have to register. Even if it's grandfather, you have to register to pay pet taxes. Well, re register for what? Pay taxes. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. You're registered with the Commissioner of Revenue, correct? Are you registered with the Commissioner of Revenue? Uh, I'm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't think. You would know. You'd be paying taxes. Yeah. You would know. Yeah, I mean, we just bought the so. Yeah. So you're not. Do you you haven't personally registered your house so. with the commission? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. But we do that. We will do that, of course. Mr. Chairman, my my suggestion to to make sure we don't mess up something here is to vote on it today, and then before it goes to council, get everything, make sure everything is right and it grandfather is right, and then you can pull it before it goes to council. I well, think that would be the safest bet. Or the safest bet for you would be to, to actually defer it because we don't know it's where it's going. Yeah. That, that, that would you know what I mean? Because it may not make Either it. Either way. Yeah. I defer move we it. defer it. Defer it? Okay. I can go with 30 that. days. Would our staff recommend your... What, what we would, would recommend date certain so that we don't have to advertise it again. And then if he chooses to withdraw it after our research, then that can be done. So what do I do now? Just wait. Huh? Just wait. Uh, uh, wait. wait till we vote. <laughs> Hold on a second. And you'll know. Need to defer it until we find out. Yeah. Need to defer it. So you're you're deferring to make sure of what? That it's grandfathered. Oh, make okay. sure that it's grandfathered. It probably won't happen today. Miss Whatever he looked Mrs. up Smith, though was what showing you, what, what it you? was. Is that it? Okay. okay, time out, time out. I'm being told time out. I'm being put in time out. Uh, no, we'll <laughs> fly <Flag in the play. laughs> I think, Ms. again, I understand everyone's caution with this. And I think Mr. Horsley's, it, it's not, it makes it a little bit more difficult for us, but it, it's, it would be the safest bet is to, is to probably defer the item. I know that there's, uh, there is some concern and continued debate with the commission at this point with this item, which is why it's being heard. So it would probably be the safer bet for you to defer it, and we'll, we can talk to you about your options uh, as we move forward, and that will give you another 30 days so that we can get everything squared away. Okay. That, I'm still not quite certain where that So is. right now our research says that the property is grandfathered grandfather. to operate as a short-term rental. We want to okay. make sure we give that to you in writing before you choose what you're going to do next. I see. Okay. Okay. So and when then, you give that to me in writing, I know that it was grandfathered. Then I could withdraw. Mm -hmm. Is that the deal? That's probably the safer bet for you. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, which is why they'd like to defer it because it appears that there might be some additional discussion from the Planning Commission and 
may not go favorably in the recommendation that they provide. So it may be best for you to defer the item mm -hmm. and then we'll get everything wrapped up for you. Okay. So with your permission, it's okay to go ahead and defer this item? I guess we'll defer the item. Okay, thank you. We're good, thank you, sir. Good deal, all right, thank you. Can I have a motion? He's gonna be in touch with me. We made a motion for deferral, we got a second. We have a second. We have a motion by uh, Mr. Inman, a second by Mr. Alcarez for a deferral. I'm sorry, who made the motion? In the uh, Mr. Inman, and second by Mr. Alcarez. Okay, motion is for a 30 day deferral. Mr. Alcarez? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent, Mr. Costin? Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against, agenda item number 22 has been deferred for 30 days. Item 24. Next item is agenda item number 24, Half Moon Extended, LLC. An application for a conditional use permit, short-term rental on property located at 305 16th Street, Unit A in the Beach District. Is the applicant or the applicant's representative? Yeah. Come forward, sir. Okay. Please state your name for the record. Hi, Richard Goldstein. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here for short-term rental approval for 305 16th Street, uh, Apartment A. Okay. Um, so let's see, uh, the property at 305 16th Street is owned by my family, specifically my parents. Um, I've leased the retail uh, storefront and the apartment above it, 305A, since 2010. I lived in that apartment until November of last year. <clears throat> uh, at that point, I purchased a home with my wife. We had, a, uh, we had our first child and just outgrew the apartment. Um, the, uh, like I said, the apartment's directly above my business. Um, and I'm on site that uh, on that site every day. Also, you know, most um, uh, pretty much every day of the year. Uh, the home I purchased is on Great Neck Road. It's about 10 minutes away with traffic, so it's no problem for me to get there quickly. Um, uh, over the 10 years I lived there, I uh, became very close friends with the other tenants on the property and the neighbors along 16th Street. Uh, I promise they will not hesitate to call me if there's a problem, and uh, I won't hesitate to solve it. <clears throat> uh, again, due to the location above my business, it's gonna affect me much more than it would affect any of my other neighbors. Um, so you can be sure of my vigilance and maintaining the uh, conditions of use, um, numbers of get, you know, number of guests, and making sure there's no parties or anything like that. Um, I do not wish to lease the part, uh, property yearly uh, for a few different reasons. Um, um, members of my family and my wife's family want to use it um, for our out-of-town guests here and there throughout the year. Um, and then it, 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 let's see. Um, much easier to control the in and out traffic when you know, when you, know, when you, you don't have a full-time tenant that has a lease on the property, things like that. Um, at some point, my business may grow, and I may need to use the uh, the space upstairs for storage or office space, and then I don't want to go through an eviction to deal with that. Um, yeah, I don't really plan to profit on this very much; just kind of recoup some of the the rental um, right. amount that I would get on that. Uh, I believe we've already been recommended for approval. Um, we, All right. we have our parking spaces in. Yeah, go ahead. Any, any questions? I don't have uh, any questions. Oh, yeah. George has questions. Uh, well, I just had, I think, I, I actually think you have had the support up here. I just had a couple questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I know there was a fire some like eight years ago. It was in 2009, I believe. Okay. And, uh, everything upstairs has been totally redone okay. in that apartment. All Permits, all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It was all done by the insurance company. Sure. Um, and then there's uh, fire alarms up there, smoke alarms. I think there's four of them throughout the whole unit. Um, Fire extinguisher is up there. And okay, um, and Unit B, what's your? Uh, so Unit B is uh, generally is used as my office mostly. Okay. Yeah. I, that's all I have. Thank you for letting me know that. Okay. Anything Having else? said that, I'll make a motion to approve. Got a motion just, for approval. Be a second. Okay. Second, uh, Mr. Horsley. A uh, motion for approval by Mr. Alcaraz. Second by Mr. Horsley. Mr. Alcaraz. Aye. You're Mr. Good. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Aye. 
Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner? Aye. By recorded vote of eight in favor, zero against, agenda item number 24 has been approved. Great. Item 25. Agenda item 25 is Gerard Jandock, an application for a conditional use permit, short-term rental on property located at 4503 Guam Street in the Bayside District. The applicant or the applicant's representative, please step forward. This is a virtual. Yeah. Virtual, a virtual okay. Yeah. All right. Mr. Jandock, if you would wait two to three seconds and then begin your comments. Good afternoon, members of uh, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Gerard Janda, and um, we're originally from New Jersey, and we purchased this property at uh, 4503 Guam Street in Virginia Beach last September. Uh, so this is our second home. Uh, we've been going back and forth to Virginia for the last five years. We just love uh, Virginia compared to Jersey Shore because the water is warmer. And it's, it's just like, it's different from Jersey. So um, I applied for the conditional, uh, short term conditional permit last December, I believe. And um, because my plan is during the summer months, um, I wanna use it as like a Airbnb, but uh, like the, the month of July, I block it for my family because I also want to enjoy the property as well. And currently, there's um, there's a tenant staying there from uh, from December to May, and I have a property manager uh, um, taking care of everything because I'm like five hours away. Um, so he does everything, and you know, if there's a problem. The tenant just uh, uh, calls him for everything that I need to. And he's also going to take care of the, uh, if it becomes, if I get the approval for the short term rental, he's also going to take care of, take care of it. Um, that's all I have to say. Any questions? Yes. No questions? Are there any speakers? There are no speakers. There are no speakers. Okay, no questions for the applicant. All right, we're going to close this and open it up for discussion. And we don't have a Bayside representative, so how about an enlarged person? Oh, well, I'm enlarged. <laughs> um, so again, um, this is another duplex, which I have a I have a problem. I just don't think that this is um, a good use. For unless they own, but I, um, so I just, um, I'm uncomfortable. He doesn't, uh, and it says right here, he doesn't own the abutting unit and it is in a neighborhood. And um, so I'm just uh, not going to support this. Anyone else? Um. The one of the same issue I had before. I'm I'm very torn on it. Um, I know I went and I went to this by drove by this house. And I'm working around right the corner from this house because this was deferred from last month. Wasn't this deferred from last month? This one. I'm ninety percent sure it was deferred from last month. Yes. And so this sign is still there. This sign has been there for six, over sixty days, which is sta stating that. Somebody's got to come out and pose it. And right next door, I mean, the sign's literally right in the middle between the duplexes. And if nobody's going to say anything about it, and I even write a letter to staff about posing it, I just, I can't, I can't see why we shouldn't approve it. I just don't see why we shouldn't. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Anybody else? Mr. Cosson? I'm with you. <laughs> if there were other people standing here in front of us as posing this right now, I would, I would have to really think about this. But with the sign being up for 60 days and nobody's opposing it, then I, yes, this is my opinion. All right, I'm, I'm, Jet? I don't know, I'm kind of with D. I mean, I, 
I get back to I go back to just the letters and discussions I've had with somebody who's a part of a duplex, and it's it's a challenge. Um, and this is shared parking. Um, uh, I mean, I, I'm kind of torn on it also, just because there is no opposition. But you know, just some of the discussions that I've had with somebody at the north end, you know, concerning it, and he's just, he's asked me, he's like, help. You know, it is it's a challenge living next to a short-term rental or a not next to, but you know, adjacent to, literally, um, and you're connected to a short-term rental. Um, just the activity, level of activity, the use of the driveway, the, the trash, um, you name it. Um, and it's, but there's nothing that we have in here that says, just because it's a duplex, you can't have a short-term rental. Um, and you know, the neighbors signed off on it. There's no opposition. No. I don't it's know. Hard, it's hard for me to justify. Mr. Acres. So um, I think there is opposition. I just think that they faded away or faded back because <laughs> what happened with city council when this came up on the east or the west side of Lesnar Bridge when Chick's Beach came in to play, and I just think they're just sitting back because they're thinking, okay, we're done, we're, we're taken care of. So that's what I'm thinking because I saw what happened when they showed up. You know, yeah. west of Lesnar Bridge, they came in droves, and um, so having said that, I'm going to be I right, gotta, right gotta, behind with. with okay, the, but I will have to say now, this house is visible from Lookout Road, so you're driving down Lookout Road, Chicks Beach, you can see the sign. I understand so that, but I'm, so I'm, it's been there for 60 days. I understand that. I'm just feeling that the Civic League is thinking that. Okay, that I understand. I know it was proposed, and the overlay district was taken away. But I just have a really strong feeling that um, that's the that's what the uh, Civic League or homeowners are thinking that nothing's going to happen over there because that what they were promised with Mr. Jones and Chris, uh, I mean, and uh, Jim Wood. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Yes. Did we not approve one in Chick's Beach recently? I we think, did. I, I think Chick's, Chick's Beach is a kind of a touristic, different kind of animal. Before. And I think we've already done one there, or a couple. Mm -hmm. We have a motion? I move that we approve the application. We have a, a, a move for approval by Mr. Costin. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second. second. <laughs> Jinx. Second by Mr. Inman. Mr. Alcaraz? Nay. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Aye. Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Nay. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Aye. Ms. Oliver? Nay. Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Nay. Chairman Weiner? Aye. Put the vote again. Yeah. It's recorded vote of four in favor and four against. Therefore, the motion is denied. Is it denied or we have to vote again? Technically, a a four to four vote is is a, a denial. denial recommendation okay. unless someone wants to reconsider their vote. All right. On to the next one. Our last agenda item for today is agenda item 27, Tanika Crew, an application for a conditional use permit short-term rental on property located at 3236 Winterberry Lane in the Princess Anne District. We have the applicant as a virtual speaker. Ms. Crew, if you would wait two to three seconds and then begin your comments. Good afternoon, my name is Tanika Crew. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today on my own behalf. I have owned the property at 3236 Winterberry Lane for about eight years or so. It is my first home and when I bought the home, it was the expectation that it would be my forever home, but my family grew. So the, the home was no longer uh, the right size for my family. So I decided to rent the home out for a short term as a long term rental. And it is currently occupied by tenants on an annual basis on a year to year, year, to year lease, excuse me. And uh, we, we recently had a few uh setbacks with the home and I, I had to take a look at it from a financial perspective to say that you know maybe leasing the home on a yearly basis basis wasn't the best um use for my family because with the hardships that we recently endured with the home 
you know, we had to take a look at the amount of income that was being brought into the into the home from leasing it on a yearly basis. So after evaluating what our options would be just to kind of try to offset expenses in managing the property, as well as things that we would like to do with our family, paying for our kids to go to college, you know, alleviating, alleviating some debt, just trying to set ourselves up for a better financial future overall. You know, we looked at potentially selling a home, but it is my first home. It is my baby. I can't part with that home because at some point that home will be paid off and that home will be left to my children and their children's children. And that is the expectation for that home. So I, I can't see selling it as an option. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I, I feel like that having it as a short term rental even if it's in an area that is is not popular or has a lot of short term rentals, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. Uh, my point being, uh, a lot of people like to vacation in this area, and they like to vacation and and stay in areas that are not necessarily near the bars, the boardwalks, and all of the 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 loudness and the areas of the of the strip. And I I feel like that having the opportunity to have a home where they can come to in a quiet neighborhood and still enjoy the city and drive to the beaches if they desire to and drive to the attractions if they desire to, but be able to come home every evening to a home that is away from the hustle and bustle of the, of the boardwalk. I feel like that families should be entitled to have that. When I travel with my family, we don't always stay right at the beach because we are a larger family. So number one, we desire a, a larger space. Hotels don't really work for us. We like to have the amenities of a, a home that has a kitchen and laundry and, and, and just a quiet space for us to decompress. But when we're ready to go to the beach or, or go out to restaurants, we have those things around us. In the area where my home is located, it's a, it's a very nice neighborhood. It has a lot of family entertainment nearby, a lot of uh, you know places that you can go and travel to, but you don't have to necessarily be near a lot of bars and a lot of tourists, and you can come home each day when you're vacation, decompress and enjoy the peacefulness. So I, I wanna say that I, I have read the letters and, and listened to the opposition of you know short-term rentals being notated as, as party homes and, it'll decrease my property value and it'll increase crime. And I just don't see how, you know, the assumptions of it being that can be valid. I don't, I haven't seen any data to truly support that this is, is the, the commonality. If someone could show me some data to say, you know, 80% of short-term rentals in, in areas that are not along the boardwalk have, have had high crime or all the party houses, I'll be open to seeing that data, but even still, you know, my whole thing is if there is a, a specific host that is not abiding by the rules or allowing guests to come in and not follow the rules or be noise or be disruptive to the neighborhood or to the neighbors, then that should be addressed with that specific owner. As me being a, a current landlord for the last two years or so, I have not had any issues at my, pro my property where my tenants have been noisy, disruptive. I, I, they've, they've actually, you know, had a great rapport with the neighbors. I've spoken to some of my neighbors that were available. Some were uh, for it, some were not based on, oh, well, I'm concerned about people, college students coming and partying and being loud. That's an assumption. So, you know, if I felt like I chose really great tenants for long-term, my own expectation personally is to continue to choose great people to dwell in my home. I, I take pride in my home. And I would never want anyone in it to be disrupted to my home or to the surrounding neighbors. Um, so I feel like I, I would love the opportunity to be able to, to operate my home as a short-term rental for my personal reasons and for my family, while also allowing the opportunity for families that want to stay in quiet areas, such as myself and my family, they should be allowed to be able to do that. And in regards to the parking plan, it was submitted, it was approved. Um, I don't think it would be a, a, a big problem to expand the driveway. It was something that I had considered doing years ago anyway, because of the fact that when I lived in the home, I had multiple vehicles and I wanted to be able to park them all in my yard. So this was, and it also in speaking with my current tenants, 
they also thought it would be a great idea to expand the driveway even before we talked about this process. So it's something that I was considering doing anyway. So I, I just appreciate the time for hearing me out and I'm open to any questions. Thank you for your comments, Mrs. Crew. Uh, any questions for Mrs. Crew? No questions, okay. We do have one speaker, Daniel Williams. Welcome, sir. Sorry you had to sit here all day. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> My name is Daniel Williams. I've been a uh, resident in that same neighborhood for 37 years. And um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to my concerns. Uh, first of all, um, I'm opposed to short-term rentals in my neighborhood. Um, on the website uh, next door, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, we've had a, a majority of people that are opposed to it. I don't know the exact number. They did a, a poll and it was like 68% uh, against it. And then there was a few, of course, that don't care. And then there was a few that the owner should be able to do whatever they want. Um, I know it's a very controversial and I, I know you've been addressing this for the last four years. Um, the neighborhood is Lanstown Meadows. It is R5D and it's very condensed. The street that the, we're talking about is very narrow. That's Winterberry. And the, the parking is a, a real issue. And especially with COVID, you know, the, uh, everybody's at home. Children playing in the streets, there's a lot of concern with the uh, short-term rental uh, of all the things that you've heard that were addressed, the uh, safety, the drinking, the partying, trash, noise. And of course, there will be opportunities, there will be families that would rent the place and they would do what they were supposed to. But there's, there's a, lo a, a known fact that those houses will be rented and partied. They have a swimming pool which attracts a large number of people. You rent a house, you got a swimming pool, you're gonna invite people, it's gonna be noisy. I have a neighbor that has a pool and they own the house. It's very noisy, once a month, he has you know, a huge family and it's accepted because they own the house and we're friendly neighbors and we, they let us know, they invite us, go to a barbecue, whatever. But short-term rental, to me, just does not fit the neighborhood quality, the same reasons that, that you've made uh, with people make their investments. I've lived there 37 years. The house is paid for. Um, you know, the house is worth close to $400,000. That house is worth oh, probably more. It's 1,900 square foot, 11,000 square foot property. It would sell probably within weeks. It's the, the market is crazy right now. High dollar, fast turnaround. I'm just not, absolutely not for short-term rentals. Um, uh, and asking for, you know, conditions, there's the parking space, it's a four bedroom, there's not enough room for parking, it's a one car garage, one car parking, She's, you got to have a conditions just to meet, meet the uh, requirements. And uh, we're not in the resort area, there's plenty of areas for the rental, we're not close to the beach, um, I just don't see a reason for it, uh, for short term rentals, and uh, thank you very much for your consideration, I hope you disapprove this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Crew, would you like to comment? Hi, thank you. Yes, I would like to comment. So um, he made a comment to state that he has a neighbor that has a pool and they're always loud and they own the house, so he tolerates it. That that's is kind of a contradictory statement. You know, we can't always control who comes and goes. The same could say it, my long-term tenant. So if I had my long-term tenants and they became disruptive, the process to try to get them out of the home would be a lot longer than a short-term rental. So if a short-term rental was a short-term renter was to come to the home for the week and I get a, a a call that they are loud or being disruptive, I can address that immediately. I can go to the home and I can ask them to leave. So if you have an owner that owns a home and is completely disruptive, you're stuck to really have to live with that, regardless of whether you like it or not. And, and that's where, you know, people are saying, well, it brings all of these, these bad things to the neighborhood. But if those things are to occur, they can be easily remedied versus a long-term renter or a, perhaps an owner. And you are right. <laughs> the property, my property 
is of great value. It is worth a lot. I am a real estate agent. I'm aware that I can sell this property in a minute. But like I said previously, it is my first home. It will always be my home. I will never sell this home. So while I do have the home, I would like to utilize it to its greatest advantage to support my family and what our goals are. And it's on top of being a responsible host slash landlord and making sure that I am following the rules and that I'm letting, I'm making sure that the people that I allow to come to my home are following the rules and remedy and address any issue immediately, because that's just the type of person and landlord that I am. Thank you. Ms. Crew. Thank you. That's all the speakers. Yeah, no more speakers. Okay. You know, we're going to close this and open it up to us for comments and Ms. So, <laughs> Mrs. Klein. Not to bash Summer because she's amazing, um, but this house actually is in the Princess Anne district. I looked it okay. up on GIS. So all right, Mr. Worsley, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of that. Um, I kind of agree with the gentleman back there. It's in, in the neighborhood it is. I just don't, I don't think it's a good fit and I will not support it. I understand. Next, anybody else? Ms. Well, Oliver? Um, this application actually had a petition of, and I don't know if any of y'all saw it, in the supplements. So there's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. There's um, over 20 signatures um, in opposition of, I did read that correctly. Um, I just want to make sure I <laughs> wasn't there more than one letter. Yes. Yes. There's was. more than a letter. Yeah. One letter yeah. plus plus the petition. Yeah. Um, against it. Well, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. You know, my, my, my comment about it. I agree with Don and <clears throat> I mean, it's a cut through street. It, it, I, I think actually the, the gentleman's comment about the pool is is a great plus for selling. It's a great plus for living there. It's not a plus for us in terms of it being an attractive. Uh, it, 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 there's going to be probably not on many occasions the decorum at the pool is probably not going to be a neighborhood type decorum. Um, so uh, and, and it and it's. There's only one other in this neighborhood, so I, I don't see proliferating uh, short-term rental in, in this neighborhood. Mr. Costin. Well, uh, I think everybody knows I'm in favor of uh, hmm. short-term rentals in specific locations, not only the ones that we've uh, decided to do according to ordinance, but things that are close to uh, venues that people would come to Virginia Beach for. And the, there's a soccer place there within, right across the street, as you come out of and cross over to Princess Anne. Uh, there's soccer fields, there's, enough, there's like two or three buildings that are designed for sports activities that people come here to participate in and would lo probably love to be close to those venues. So I would support it. Anybody else? Motion? I make a motion application be denied. I just, I feel the neighborhood and with the swimming pool and the man says, you know, and I agree, they, uh, pool parties can get loud, but if your neighborhood, you don't, your neighbors don't have pool parties every day, every week, but uh, a short term rental like this, you could have a pool party every week, uh, two or three nights a week. So I agree that uh, I don't think it fits in this neighborhood. Uh, a motion for denial for, by Mr. Horsley. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Alcaraz. This motion is for denial. Mr. Alcaraz? Aye. Mr. Barnes is absent. Mr. Costin? Nay. Mr. Graham is absent. Mr. Horsley? Aye. Mr. Inman? Aye. Ms. Klein? Nay. Ms. Oliver? Aye. Aye. For Aye. Yeah. Denial. M Mr. Redman is absent. Vice Chair Wall? Aye. Chairman Weiner. Aye. By record, a vote of six in favor and two against. Agenda item number 27 has been denied. All right, that's it. Any old business, any new business? Anyone want to talk about anything? 
I want to thank the officers in the back. Thank you very much for being here today. Always thank you all. Um, any, anything else? We're, we're done. We're adjourned.